Well, it's another beautiful day here in the Eiffel Mountains as we get ready for what is termed top qualifying. Basically, this is a shootout to get into the session that will decide pole position. Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the 51st running of the ADAC Total Energy Nürburgring 24 hours. John Heindorf, Bruce Jones and Peter Snowden for this first part of uh, our excitement for you on Friday as we set the grid, the front of the grid for tomorrow's race. Everyone except SP9 and S SPX, say that quickly a few times in the middle of the night, have had their pole positions confirmed. Um, we'll go through all of that tomorrow from the other classes because we want to focus in now on the fastest cars around this 15 and a half mile circuit. They are ultimately going for the Glickenhaus Trophy, which is the pole position trophy first awarded five years ago. And see if they can add their name to that. Six years ago, my apologies. Counting the names on that. The qualifying record has stood for five years and is a tad over eight minutes for the whole of the Nordschleife and the longer version of the Grand Prix circuit that we have here. Now, 14 cars have now qualified uh, for the next part of the shootout. Um, we'll, we went through them earlier on, Bruce Jones. Uh, we added 13 came from NLS uh, uh, lap times and results and the qualifying weekends. We added uh, a specific place for a Pro-Am car at the right at the end of the qualifying three session. That was stolen away, they would say, from the number six Mercedes. And it was a Ferrari that grabbed the spot. The Ferrari set the fastest time, but am I not correct that the, the... Snowy, you were talking about mm. you needed to set it around an entire lap. What were you talking about? Because we're comparing the number six Bilstein Mercedes and the racing one Ferrari that went yes. faster, but you were yes. talking about sector splits. Please explain exactly how that worked. Talk about being put on the spot. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh. No. Right, yeah. Well, okay. 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 What, me? You've got the right, Peter. Yes. Good luck. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it was... Um, the, the two were very, very, very different. We were talking to some of the drivers over there about that Ferrari, and they're saying that they're, they're very, very happy about it. But it's, um, I, it's, it's a difficult one to, to call out that. It, cars are going to be full of fuel. Um, they were saying this morning that they weren't really trying too much. This is, this is the bit they're saving it for. So is it exactly within the regs or not? Does it, does it count? It's a, a little bit deceptive this morning. I think what it's about and the things we saw. So uh, I'm not I'm not completely convinced. I think there's a lot to see. This this will bring it out for us now. Okay. Well, to paraphrase, we've got 14 cars yep. through. Yep. We've got the next 20, which is the remaining cars in SP9 and SPX, Correct. shooting for five positions. So it's yes. 20 into five. They have allotted their starting order. They'll go one at a time. That was done by, completely by. Um, Raffle, effectively, it's a lottery. It, they, it, they were drawing numbers out they do. of that. They do, it's quite they, literally. Yes. There's nothing more complicated than that. Um, and I think for the N24 qualifier race, they actually get some of the spectators on the grid to do that. Right. Yeah, they, yeah they, they come and pick out yep. them and right, yeah. you're first. That's and right. reshuffle the order of the car. So look, it, this is top qualifying uno. Yep. We will go to top qu <laughs> qualifying two later on. So what we're interested five. in is 20 cars yep. going for five places. Yep. And they this go is off just one on lap time. time. This is Entirely just on, on lap time. time. So this is a shootout to get into the pool shootout. Yeah. If, you, if, you can, if you're not used to this type of, of thing, think about Formula One where you have Q3 and you drop out some cars at the bottom. Q2, you drop out some cars and you're left with 10 to go for pole position. It's a, a little, it's a little bit diff difficult, different here because the ones who are shooting out for pole, the number that are shooting out for pole is entirely dependent on how many cars are in those two classes. It happens to be 19 this year in terms of the pole shootout. Were there more in the class? That would be extended, but it's 19, so Bruce is entirely correct. 
we've got 20 cars going for five places and it matters not at all if you are SPX or SP9 if you're one of the top five you're going through and you've got a chance then to shoot out for pole position if you do transfer through in those five spots you cannot use the same driver in the next uh, in the next running now that probably means not that much to most of the full pro cars because they've got three pretty gun drivers but if you're a pro am car that might give you more of an issue um, to qualify through here you would really want to put your your pro a good pro driver in it and then he can't do the next session for the pool shooter okay just looking at the pro-am runners i got my orange pen out yes, on this that. chart daniel Carvitz would be going second he's in the wtm by rinaldi racing ferrari he yeah. was super quick in he that was dual motorsport you've got darren turner well if he's in your car you would get him going that's the number 69 aston martin the next pro-am car the car that sort of we thought had squeaked in but didn't the number 19 racing one ferrari johannes stengel now he is not one of the quicker drivers in that lineup so they're sort of are they just giving him track time or are they banking on him squeaking in somehow and then one of their quicker drivers going later on but uh, mike david ortman he's very quick he'll be going last in the number 28 pro sport racing aston martin um so we'll see. So I think three of those four pro, um, yeah. pro am cars have put, the, put one of their quicker drivers in for the, for the session. And there's some big names to go here, none bigger than the car that will set the pace. Kevin Estra is behind the wheel of the number 911 Porsche 911 GT3R, the new 992 machine. And that therefore, you know, Kevin's going to go out there, and if he gets through, we hear it will be Fred Matavecki who will do the next bit of qualifying. An embarrassment of riches, one oh, feels. But, but an embarrassment, a total embarrassment, if that team, who have been known to drive their cars from Moispath, which is just up the Dottinger Hoa, round the back of Gottlieb, Daimler Straße, and then uh, down in the industrial estate on the right-hand side, that is their race shop. If they don't get in here, uh, that means, at best, they'll start 20th. It'll be a mutiny. Well, it will be beyond embarrassment, is all I can say on that front. But just again, scanning down that list, some of the very quickest drivers at the moment, plus some who've got great history from the past. Jesse Crone is flying this year in a BMW M4 GT3. Mikkel Grenier, he's in an SBX class car, but uh, we'll see how he fares in that. But Matteo Caroli, Ricardo Feller, who's just sensational this year. Sheldon van der Linden, nobody's fooled him. Matteo Drury, we've got some of the very quickest drivers, but only five of them go through, just remember that. SPX car is the... Um GT2 Mercedes uh, in still um, being it's the its homologation is is set but uh, that car here in particular is has been by AMG customer racing has been limited to 280 kilometers an hour they think that's as quick as that car uh, should be going in the spec it's it's basically if you don't know what this GT2 car is it's been a concept that they had for quite a long time. Peter, you worked with uh, AMG and Mercedes back in, in the UK. It was a, a sort of a coming together of two ideas. They have the Black Series road car and the GT4 race car. And they've combined a GT4 race car with this hugely powerful engine, uh, over 700 horsepower it can give, um, and elements of the GT4 race car. They've turned the engine down to a barely adequate 650 horsepower oh, here. Trifling, <laughs> trifling. Where's the point in going racing? Um, yeah, but the, the point is, though, what, what, what are they doing? What are they making this car for? Mm. To sell cars, customer yeah, cars, to amateurs. Exactly so. Amateur drivers, in the nicest possible way, that want to go up for a little bit, step up a little bit from, say, uh, GT4. Yeah. But what do you do with this? SPX category, X4, homolog not yet fully homologated Correct. cars. Experiment. Experimental. Yeah. Might have been said. So what do the manufacturers and teams running that car want to do? They work from the other end of that. They want to sell these cars to amateurs and get them to buy them, pro-am lineup, so then put their pro driver in. So, yes, if it's set already and it suddenly does too well, what happens then? Balance of performance. Right. So it's all a little bit of smoke and mirrors and sandbagging of. You, you don't actually want it to do so well. So in some ways, this is not entirely representative well, and it, of that particular category, and that it, particular car being the, the GT2. And ultimately, somewhere, it will be racing against other GT2 cars rather than GT4, Big GT3. picture worldwide, exactly. So, yeah. you know, in, in so, it, 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 this is not an extended test because that would be the wrong thing to say, but this is a, com a competitive test for this car uh, and for people who are likely to run it 
to give them some opportunity to shake out anything that needs shaking out. The problem with Mercedes is, um, and I say this in a very nice way, uh, as a problem, um, they make rather good cars. It's, it's a nice problem to have, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But you said it's, it, it's the first proper test in a competitive environment. Yeah. And that's where, it, because all the talking's over now, all the design, all it's done, all the trash, it's there, it's now, this is it, this is real. And this is why teams come back to this place time and time again, because there's no better place to test these cars than the Nordschleifer. Mm. Uh, I, I have to say, although leading up to this has been in some ways tremendously complicated, Bruce, I do like these um, brain out, no nonsense, mindless boogie laps that we're going to get in this session and in the next one. It gives us an opportunity maybe to, it's pretty good conditions, it's just clouding over a, a little bit with the, which the engines will like, which the tyres will like, and that five-year-old qualifying record may be in jeopardy today. One factor here, the track temperature, uh, we heard talk that it was 38 degrees, and that's because it's, you've, we've often had sunshine here at the ring at this time of year, but just not from dawn onwards. So it's really built up through the day. There have been the tyre problems, of course, that was on marginally longer runs, but right now it's going for glory and the car that's going to go first in just over four minutes time, sitting at the front of the queue, the cars are formed up on the grandstand side of the start finish straight in 20 cars line astern, so the, the clock is going to be ticking very soon indeed. The three-minute board about to be raised in front of the 911, the Manti, the Grello Porsche, green and yellow. If you wonder what we talk about Grello, it was a nickname coined many years ago. It stands out beautifully in daylight, even better after dark because it's luminous and it's going to shine come what may because Kevin Estra is going to be driving it. And he, I, I just always think, all oh, these drivers are super fast, but Kevin Estra, to me, is one of a handful who have a really rock-solid sort of aggressive nature I and mean, we put two cars on a track and you sort of always feel come what may Kevin may come out in front but right now it's about purity of his lap going one at a time but we did we did coin a phrase from him. it's not going to happen in this because it's, it's single car at a time is the run but we did coin a phrase didn't we a few years ago with him uh, Bruce of, of, of Kevin pass on the grass extra yes because he had this ability to put not just you know a, a bit of the tire two wheels on the grass but maintain momentum in clean fair racing and get past somebody and it was one of the things where you watch something somebody do something you think that shouldn't work that shouldn't happen but they do and pull it off such as their ability um you know uh, david pittard in the in the flick of the ferrari another one pitbull pittard i asked him over in the uh, in the paddock area so are you in uh, are you in uh, pitbull mode yet and he went full <laughs> one word answer i can relate to that's what i call an interview i'm going to, i'm going to be muzzled before <laughs> yeah, I get exactly to yeah, yeah. yeah on that lead <laughs> yes uh, yeah. so this is then um, not obviously when you when you've got a lap time of uh, of something over eight minutes, they, they are not going to allow a car to go and do its lap before they start the next one. So expect to see this uh, these cars put off at between twenty to thirty seconds intervals. Uh, the idea is, there's, there's nothing to say by the way that you have to go flat out straight away, and there's nothing to stop you overtaking no. the car in front. Uh, if you decide after your first lap that you've done enough, you could come back round and into the pit lane at the end of the Grand Prix circuit. But if you do that, that's you over. You cannot go back out again. Uh, those five that qualify and transfer through into the pole shootout will come back into the pits, change their drivers, change their tyres, and refill to a full tank of fuel which they all have now. All of these cars have been re-scrutineered and re-weighed and made sure that they have a full tank of fuel before they go out. It's a beautiful afternoon. Sun just popping in and out behind some uh, high cloud that's coming in from over the Mercedes Arena. And Kevin Estra will lead them off onto the Nordschleife. And it will be a full sighting lap for all of these cars the cones on the front straight have disappeared so at the end of the lap uh, they will come through and start their flyer now tire warm-up particularly for the Porsches we had three Porsches in Q3 with left rear problems and as Estra goes off uh, they, have, they have been discussing with Michelin what is going on uh, with the tyres, well, that's only about 10 seconds or 
thereabouts before the WTM by Rinaldi Racing Ferrari 296 has gone off. That was Daniel Kalvitz. It's Mike Rockenfeller for Audi and Team Scherer. He heads off down towards the first corner in the 40 Conrad Motorsports. It's Yelma Berman behind the wheel of the Conrad coloured Lamborghini number seven. Lauren Heinrich for Porsche and Dynamic GTSRL in the 54. Then Denny Marshall for uh, the 22 car collection car in that throwback livery. Door Motorsport, Aston Martin, the 69 car. This is the black car with the white stripes. They have the 68, which is the car is reversed uh, on that. The colours are reversed on that. Darren off then. Jesse Kron for Valkenhorst Motorsport and the Yokohama coloured 101 BMW. It will be Huber Motorsports Com Ledegar in the 25 Porsche, the multicoloured machine. Then the Thomas Jaeger driven GT2, that's the SPX, first of the SPX car. Looking, I mean, that's a, that's a stock Mercedes-Benz colour as that car rolls out. Blue and white Ferrari is next, that's the racing one car. We know that car is fast, but is Johannes quick enough behind the wheel? Then the second of the GT2 cars, the triple two, Schnitzelarm. Uh, racing, uh, Michael, Michael Grenier, Rutronic Racing Porsche, they had a puncture uh, in Q3, and that curtailed their run. Share of Sport PHX, Ricardo Feller in the 16 Audi is away 14th, second of the Yokohama BMW, so neither of those Falcon Horse BMWs automatically into the pole shootout. This is a big few minutes for both of those cars. Alexander Sims, fresh from WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca in the blue and white number five, Audi. He's off and running now. Rover Racing, another one of their cars. Some big names here, Shelton von der Linde in the 98. Team Get Speed, Fabian Schiller in the Mercedes. That's the red car getting away, number two. Number one, Audi Sports team sharer, Mattia Trudy in the uh, sort of IMSA colours. Remember those cars. And finally, a finalement, the number 28, green and white, Dumani Aston Martin from Pro Sport with Mike David Ullman behind the wheel. Snowy, whilst the guys are going round, you've been talking to the Porsche teams. Uh, about the um, relatively large changes that have been made. 20 kilos, that's a sizable amount of weight, but on a car that weighs 13, 1400 kilos is, you know, all right, it's a, it's a smaller percentage. But the big thing that's been talked about, even apart from the, the two and a half degrees on the rear wing, nine degrees of rake angle added to that car. And that, that's a big change for all of those Porsche teams. It is, and it, it's, it, it's a result of the, the drivers of the, all the Porsche drivers, this 992 generation cars, saying that they're, they're struggling, uh, basically calling the exit speed, just hasn't got the speed, they're, they're struggling to get onto the straight with it, hasn't got the power. So they've been asking for, for more power. And in that, in that BOP, that Bouncer Performance Bulletin, they've been given more power on the restrictor, but that's why they put the rake in. So basically, okay, you've got your power, but you can't just have that. You've got to take something else away. Otherwise, it's not a balance, doesn't fit the title. What they're saying is, my understanding it is, that the car, the 992, it's still really in development, and it hasn't, my understanding is, and this is my, my opinion of it is, it hasn't quite got its sweet spot yet. And they're working that car really, really hard, quite close to its limit of its envelope of performance anyway. And now, with this extra bit of power, the tyre's going to work in a different way on, certainly in the corners, certainly on getting onto the power, uh, on the sidewalls, etc., coming out on the on the exits, and it's it's having a, a little bit of issue with that heat this morning. Adding that layer of 38 degrees tap, track temperature has been causing a few problems. I don't think that will be the case now because I'm sure this track temperature has probably dropped about five degrees at least since we had saw this morning, at least probably near a ten. So a warm-up lap and a maximum of two flying laps. 
James Hall. Alex Sim, not a BMW driver anymore, realised he's in the number five Audi. Uh, he's uh, effectively a works Cadillac driver uh, now in GTP, but released by Cadillac. Oh, he's released the right word. Has he been sent on a fact-finding mission? Schnitzel or cake? These are factors that need <laughs> to be decided. But the thing that always strikes me, John, with this qualifying shootout, it's, as you say, you kick off with 25 kilometres or 15 miles just to get your eye in before you get to attack the lap. There's no just traditional, you know, three, four kilometre circuit and round you come. But a few little interesting things to me. You talked about the power of the GT2 cars, the two, <coughs> excuse me, Mercedes. And already at the first speed trap, they're the fastest cars through there. So they've got all that grunt, and, but their wings aren't as big and the other factors. But it's a different way of mixing it together. Uh, right turn lover just joining us. Hello, RTL. Romeo Tago Lieber checking in. Um, why is the racing one Ferrari in TQ1 was the spot from the early qualifying session set on a formula rather than the outright lap time? Uh, again, Snowy, just go through that again as people are joining us here with the cars on their outlap at the moment. The, the, the Ferrari did put in the fastest yep. lap that we've seen of anybody this week in any of the three qualifying sessions. It is a Pro-Am car. Why does, is it still in this session rather than going directly through to TQ2? Because it's a full Pro lineup. No, no, it's not. No? No. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, got the wrong car. Sorry, yes. Sorry, Bruce, go ahead. No, so uh, the two cars that were contesting the top two positions were the number six, yep, yep. Pro-Am, yep. Mercedes from Team Bilstein, and the, and the racing one, yep. Pro, which was 19. But uh, I thought you came up with a gobbit of information about the, comp the why that had been reversed, because I'd already written mm. down the 19 Ferrari yeah, yeah, that had gone through. I'm just also watching side that uh, Matteo Crowley just went past one of the Mercedes. You were talking about on this. Yeah, yeah, you're allowed to overtake. Yes, no, but yeah. what I'm saying is that I guess it's allowed to, but I'm just, why is Mercedes so slow already? So uh, early in. So come back to Ferrari. It, yeah. Was it was it a, 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 um, a, a, an aggregate lap time or a different lap time, or they hadn't enough fuel in, or they had too much? Or what? I think it's an aggregate lap time. Really? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sure uh, that's it's a formula. I'm sure it's a formula. Yes. Formula lap yeah. time. Okay. Uh, so that that is why. See that on the piece of paper. That we said, best lap time. Gosh, it's not like they try to make it complicated, is it? No. So, anyhow, wrong. now we're getting to the purity of it all. It's, it's a qualifying shootout, part mm. one. Yes. Thank you. Fastest pro am car. The starting place will be allocated to the team with the fastest theoretical lap time. That was on the right hand yeah. side of the from time. The addition yeah. uh, uh, of the average value of the five fastest sector time for each sector for the purpose of the result sector times of three qualifying sessions will be combined and analysed. Did As you get that done? As you said, they don't make it complicated, do they? And that was in very small writing at the bottom there. I was going to say, let's go through that again, but let's talk about the cars on the track, because right, they're the, dynamic. The, the, right, purity starts right here. This is about one driver, one car, one set of tyres, a full tank of fuel and a potential of two laps around the full Nürburgring 24-hour circuit, which includes the run all the way down to the uh, recently renamed Dunlop hairpin at the bottom, uh, excuse me, Goodyear hairpin at the bottom of the circuit. So just over 15 miles around and Kevin Estra trips the B and heads down through the turn one. It's also the cut through uh, on to, they can't use the uh, the full right hand turn. It's the cut through there because that is absolutely chock full of paddock space that's required. So it's the little kink left and right. And how hook through the Mercedes Arena. Estra now coming down to the rebranded timing tower at the Goodyear hairpin. We'll have coverage of the Falcon Drift Show from there later on this evening. So around about 10 seconds or so, there's no minimum or maximum lap time for your warm-up lap. You can take it as much as you like. Daniel Kylowitz in the Ferrari 296. And Estra's setting the pace at the moment on this first of two laps and has the best split time of the three cars that have come through. That includes the uh, Ferrari and the Audi R8 LMS GT3. So the WTM by Ronaldi Ferrari. The Audi Sport team share 
PHX. Oh, in the pits. Yeah, car number 22, which is... Uh, Danny Marshall. Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Marshall bringing the car in. That's Team Car Collection 1. So, of course, does that discount him once he's in the pits? If he, has, unless, unless, uh, if he hasn't done a full, hasn't done a full lap, lap. He's he hasn't done the Grand Prix circuit. No. Flying lap. So no. I think, well, if he's going to do anything, it's going to be right at the end of this uh, first uh, top qualifying, top qualifying one. But a little bit of concern on some of those faces in the Audi car collection going. I, I think he, he must have been onto the... I, 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 I think you're right, John. It's too long, too long to have come back into the... Unless he's GP circuit now, yeah. unless he's had a problem of resetting us. He's been out, been out too long. Kevin Estra. The wick is up, effectively. Yeah. Kevin Estra just suddenly burst into shot, kicking up dirt on the outside of the circuit, and then, of course, immediately turning into the next one. We've got 170 corners or so to knit together in this lap, but he's holding nothing back. You sense as he went down to the, uh, the yeah. Goodyear hairpin, he was already pulling clear. <laughs> yeah, over the brow and heading up the hill from the Flugplatz. Uh, that right-hander... After the brow of the hill. Using, using every millimetre of track oh, available there on the left to turn in. Absolute best. More than the Ferrari best. behind. Absolute best, personal best, absolute best, absolute best in the first four. Daniel Kalvitz has the absolute best in two, in sector two. So Estra, two and a half minutes, coming up to three minutes into what will be a low eight-minute lap around the Grand Prix circuit and then on to the Nordschleifer Kovacs now heading down into the Foxhall. This is insanely quick. And meantime, Esther already coming up the other side to add an half force, down a gear, down a gear, down a third gear as he turns through the left and on the right. You can sacrifice the next couple of corners. He's riding the curves and up onto the block paving. The next couple of corners, it's not important to get them right. Looks like the 22. Uh, is not going any further unless uh, is the driver out of that? No, I think no, he's still no, on board. Still on board. But what we what the drivers are having now is the first time all meetings so far they've had clear track ahead Correct. of them. The first time the best lap we've seen so far is eight minutes twelve. Down through Kalmhard and down towards the plunging set of corners. The three right handers that are oh, that he was so committed through there. Um, now, here comes the Audi out of the pit lane, the number 22 car. Minimum pit time? Minimum pit time. You, you were commenting earlier, John, about uh, Kevin Estra and Adenauer Ford earlier on in that session this morning, how we were saying how it went through in one gear. Yeah. This, I didn't it's say it's only quite this time, not one down, two yeah. gears down, yeah. fully lit, brain in the glove box, qualifying lap. The, it, it's quite important that that I mean that section is a rhythm section and one of the things that helps you with the rhythm there is as you go through the compression and up the other side you that the at the end of the foxhole the um, gradient helps you and so does your down changes down one for the right down one for the left down one for the left but already Estra is climbing the hill and heading up towards the far side of the circuit and as we're looking at uh, we've got Daniel Carvitz matching him almost tenth of a second, right. tenth of a second. Quicker in some, they are very, very close. Mike Rockefeller in third place in the queue. Oh, yeah, nowhere. yeah, the and unfortunately, a, we've got one That's a big one. That's a Morgan big one. Horse, Morgan, Morgan, 102. Yes, he crown, 102, not... Uh, oh, yeah. sorry, that's further down. That's, yeah, that's uh, Christian Kron, yes. Christian Kron's, yeah, yeah. And that that's was, a big one. That's a lot of damage on the front left. Do you know, when... Uh, and that's going to kill anybody. Anybody yeah. but like behind 15th yeah. place in the yeah. queue. So Ricardo Feller was the car in front. The first 15 will be fine, but those behind, of course, uh, that, will have. The, they might have to stop this. They may have to. He's pulled so much of the tyre barrier. Yeah, hats and back at the end of hats and back. Yeah, so the run. cars behind who will be affected behind Christian Kronos Jackson, Alex, Alexander Sim, Sheldon van der Linde, Fabian Schiller, Matthias Rudy, some of the top drivers there. There was so much of that car missing when we got our first sight of it. I actually thought. It was a car from a different race yeah. or a different class that was behind the barrier somewhere. Yeah. And that's a huge one. He's come through and hits the curb on the left hand side. It's right at the end of the hats and back. Then he's drifting. Looks all right there. But there's dirt on the road. And his uh, left hand yeah. Yokohama tyres, the working side tyres there, seem not to have any grip. Did he have a tyre problem already? 
at that point. And my goodness, how close was Marco Vipman to hitting the debris that had been pulled on the track? The tyres there that guard the guard rail are banded together with that, uh, that rubber almost conveyor belt and they've been dragged away some six, eight, 12 feet onto the track and half the track is blocked there. This may be the only lap for Kevin Estra because he will not be able to go through the end of the hats and back uh, at full speed. His early time in the first sector has been beaten by somebody um, further down the order, but he's still got the clear track ahead of him as he's coming through now two thirds of the way around the circuit through the Stefan Belloff S and now positioning the car on the right hand side of the road to drop into the Kleiner carousel. The swallow's tail. Do oh. not discount the Ferrari that's going to no, 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 Daniel exactly. Kalvich took three tenths of a second out of him, yeah. one of the longer stints, but it's going to be super close. I'm afraid Mike Rockefeller, third in the line, doesn't see oh, no, red flag, red, red, flag. red flag, red flag. I think this is, this is fair. He, it's absolutely fair. It's fair. This is, you know, it, it, you cannot expect people on a one lap shootout to be disadvantaged when someone else has put the car into the wall. And that would, there would be no chance there for a flying lap for. Uh, Alexander Sims and Sheldon van der Linde and Fabian Schiller and Matteo Trudi and Mike David Ortman. So I think that's absolutely fair. The intervention vehicles have had to go out there to start putting the tyres back, which that is the easier job. The harder one, Peter, is going to be recovering that BMW with three wheels on its wagon and uh, quite a lot of bodywork missing on that car, including the driver's door. Well, yeah, and also the front left wheel is completely gone. Yeah, it's ripped away. the whole unit off the car, so that could have done sub substructure, whatever, so on right. and so forth. It looks, it looked from what little we saw of it, John, and we, we all saw the same little bit, and just, just trying to describe what we saw, was it just looked like he's understeered off to the left, but it's, mm. it's taken those tyres first. Of course, the, the great thing of those tyres is that they're easier to replace than barriers, it's like, but it does a lot less damage to the car initially, but at speed like that, as it blends out into it, it pulls the car in, and then you whack the barrier behind really hard, and that's what's happened. It's, it's in an instant, it's rotated that car around 360 degrees, taking the front left wheel and door off. So that's, that's, that's a big, big impact, and uh, I would be very surprised on initial summary of that, seeing if that car's in the race. Uh, certainly, the elements of it, and in he, fact, it was Marco Wittmann who was following him, who got the face full of everything yeah, yeah, on the yeah. track. I mean, it looks all right as he goes through. It, look, it looks innocent, John. Um, it's just understand. It, it's, and was, you said that there's a trail of dust which you spotted straight away. It's almost as if somebody else has picked up something and it's just literally got on the proverbial got, marbles and it's just run wide. Did he, did he get a left foot puncture? I, I, that's the can, on, only thing I can think of because it, it, it almost... Here's it on board. Oh, no, it's the car behind. Mark so Wittman, Wittman was yeah. the man who... Yeah. Had, I mean, we uh, were talking of Sheldon van der Linde, but Mark Wittman started that 98 yeah. Rover racing BMW. Can I just chip Excuse in me, here? Yes. Because, right, just like I said, that Kevin Estra, the car that was leading the queue around 911, I said he's already kicking up the dirt, and that is the point. Yeah, good point. What, a dozen cars later or so, that it may have just... The others may have been just slightly tighter. There's a little bit of understeer taking Christian Cronius just to the left, and then he went on to where that dust the, was. The sitting. curbs there at the end of the hats and back... Um, as you're coming through uh, towards the tighter parts at the end. Great spectator place there, by the way. The curbs there are quite high if you hit them in the middle of the corner. Mm -hmm. So what people tend to do is roll up them at the beginning and onto, and sometimes even over, the little bit of block paving that's there. And if you go over that, that's when you bring the dirt onto the track. Now... I just wonder if that's what's happened. There's some also... I'm trying to see there. Well, there's a lot of... And, and now, of course, those tyres are full of water yep. because they hold water forever and a day. It's been perfect this week. We've not had a drop of precipitation. But that's run out over the track as well. So that's now going to be slippery. But the, the block paving on the, the right-hander beforehand... There's actually, just over the edge of that block paving, you can see where people have been going onto the grass and taking the grass out and throwing the dirt on. And I wonder if that has been uh, a contributory factor there. So all of that excitement, all of that adrenaline, Peter, from the drivers, and they've got to turn it off, come back in, cool down, the mechanics will change tyres, they will refuel these cars, 
and then they're going to have to sit around for a bit. Yeah, but the key thing, you're absolutely right, that's the case, but the key thing both of you said was when, that, when it was red flagged is the first thing you said, John, was that's fair. It is fair. Now, as a, from a driver's point of view, if you come in there and find somebody who's got advantage, that's when it messes with your head. The fact that it's now the same for everybody, it's a level playing field again. OK, these things happen, that's what it is. Drivers are very, very good at just going reset, done, right, what do we do now, next? Yeah, now I tell you what, we were getting very excited about the, the flamboyant pace being set by the first car in that queue, Kevin Esther in the, in the Manti Racing Porsche, but actually looking at the split times through the first six of the sectors, Daniel Karlwitz was up by about two tenths of a second in the, in the second car in the queue, that was the number 20 mm. Ferrari, so it wasn't a given. But it was certainly getting very fast. Now, of course, we have the interruption. At RSL underscore studio, hashtag uh, RSL. Uh, sorry, N, uh, RSL N24. Yes, RSL N24 uh, on RSL underscore studio. Um, I was also amazed, John, how far that car... It's gone 100 metres on from hitting the wall there. Uh, I know it's the tyres and it's bounced it's back a, out again, but it's... Well, that's good, fast there. Yeah, well... Was yeah. that fourth gear, probably? Fourth down to third? It's probably, probably just going up, yeah. So, the, the track is going to be cleaned and it will a be a complete reset. That's what we're hearing from race control. The, it is a complete reset uh, from uh, what we've said. So, basically, what we've seen hasn't happened. The track has to be cleaned. Uh, the Unimog <laughs> is there with some spare barriers and some spare tyres if it needs to be one of the Unimogs, I should say. Is there a slight advantage here, gentlemen? I'll take uh, thoughts from both of you. To the guys who have done three quarters of a lap at full speed, because well, they've seen, Peter, more of the track and more of the conditions where everybody else has tottered around under red flag. Yeah, yes, there's going to be something. To, I think it's a little bit psychosomatic. There is. It really depends on how long it takes to, to repair the track. Mm -hmm. If it's, it's a five, ten minute delay, then yes, you've got a little bit of an idea. If it's half an hour or more, uh, then probably that, that's wiped out because the temperature drops even further. Um, I'll tell you what, you say that, that first session never happened. I guarantee the, the crew on the 100 Welcome Horse BMW will say it's most certainly how. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look, look, look at our car. Yeah. It's looking... Uh, what's the phrase that Mike Salmon used to say? It's decidedly second-hand. <laughs> I think it's pre-loved, actually. Yes, yes. Pre-loved. Yes. So, so, despite the fact that we've got a piece of paper that says Christian Cronje is there, it... it, it uh, no, it was Christian Cronje. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. was it was it was uh, two cars further back. It was, uh, it was Marco Wittmann who Marco Wittmann rather than Sheldon von der Linde in the yeah. And car. I think okay. what happened, he may have pulled ahead of Alexander Sims because he certainly right. was the next car around the he corner was, behind absolutely. as the black and red uh, Walken Horse motorsport car was bouncing off the barriers. Of course, Walken Horse have already got one of their cars through uh, to final qualifying because they managed to get, take one of two of uh, one of the three. Spaces in the pro am class on that yeah. sheet in front of you, John. That's the um, mm. their pro am car. So it's ironic that their their am their pro cars <laughs> are out still fighting to try and get into top qualifying too. And yeah. one of them is certainly not doing that. And uh, let's hope Christian Cronius isn't feeling too rough. Well, he's going to feel those uh, <laughs> where the seat belts were earlier on when you have uh, uh, later on. Excuse me, when you have a shunt like that, and it was a very quick stop. And uh, you're going to feel that the bruising will start to come out probably on Sunday, actually. So he will be, uh, I'm afraid, feeling a little worse for wear. He'll be taken to the care centre here at the circuit and checked over. Now, that car, uh, with, as, as with most of the SP9 Pros, we were seeing this earlier, Peter, only three drivers uh, declared for that car. And uh, in years past, we've had sort of four. Slightly worrying if... Uh, if he can't continue, but they're made of tough stuff, these lads. If you're just joining us, either in sound or vision, live and free, uh, no blocks, no brakes for these sessions. The Christian Cronius driven BMW M4 GT3, the number 102, making heavy contact with the tyre wall at the end of the hats and back, early part of the lap, and then sliding its way down, shedding bodywork and the left front wheel and suspension that whole corner gone from that car. We've seen bits of the uh, BMW understructure that we shouldn't really. And Peter saying earlier on that that's a bad place for a hit. It is really a bad for a place for a hit. You've got that um, front 
subframe structure there and if anything's been pushed back peter that's that's what will do for it the safety cage did its job very very that, that, well that'll be fine the actual, the actual tub will be fine what will be, the problem will be the engine bed yeah so you've got your suspension components all that that's that's replaceable we'll have all those so that's torn off that's that's one of those things brackets etc it's the engine bed yeah that's behind it you're then getting into a major strip of basically stripping the car overnight from the windscreen forward yeah and rebuilding it and that is serious work to do that um are they i i, I'm, I should know this um but are the front chassis legs uh, integral to the whole body, or are they a bolt-on stroke bolt bolt on. thing? On, on, bolt on. Yeah, so yeah. they are a bolt-on on the yeah. M4. Okay. Yeah. Because it has to be the same as the road car, of course. For, exactly. For, for GT3 regulations. I oh, they're, ju that. they're just like a road car. Yeah. yeah. They're near identical. Yeah. I, I, I mean, just you yeah. just can't get them in those yeah. colours. That's no, all. Exactly. No, there was a big smile on Peter's face when he said that. <laughs> uh, it's the 51st running of the uh, ADSA Total Energy. 24 hours of the Nürburgring. We are under a hold. Red flag uh, for that accident for the car that went out. That's 15th out of the 20 cars in this first qualifying session. And the Yokohama BMW. Well, don't forget that Christian Crohn's is also down to drive the 101 car as well at Wolkenhorst. Yeah. Refueling. Just slightly confused me there, seeing it in the pit lane with a filming crew going in, yeah. so focusing in. So hang on a minute, we've got. To, I forget he's actually he's littered as driver number one in the 101 car and driver number four mm -hmm. in the 102 car. Uh, race control reminding all of the drivers: refueling at this point yeah. for those 20 is mandatory. You must have. And so easy to miss that. Yes. Because in the heat of the moment, it's been stopped. It's not your fault. You say it's fair. You right. We sit here. We wait. We forgot to refuel it, and all of a sudden, you fall and foul the rules. Correct. Uh, the if you again just joining us, the whole of this session will be restarted, which means there is no park firm here, so the teams can work on those cars. Now, that actually might be a little advantage to the cars that got further round. Because Kevin Estra, who got to, he got all the Yeah, he got through all the twisty bits, mm. basically, and he might be saying, "I think we started on the wrong pressures." Now we found out what a great piece of work Bruce Jones was spot on. High five for the big fella, because he was spot on. It was right over the curbs for Kevin Estra. I said they like to ride those curbs and get onto the. Uh, to get onto the flat topped um, block paving, it is yep. uh, sort of brick sized Gra block grass paving. Grass type yeah. stuff. Uh, no, it, it, it's, it's like block paving yeah, yeah. that you would have on your drive, uh, and you know, laid at different uh, angles. And they've all been across there, but it was definitely started with, I think, almost all four wheels by Estra. But even so, it was, I mean, I don't even think he's offline. No, there, I, was, I was going to say, ironically, John, if Christian Crohn's had actually gone further over to the right like totally everybody else, agree. he'd have got away with that. Totally Unfortunately, agree. he's taken a clean, tidy line through there, which he's put him on the detritus left by Kevin Estra's Grello, and that's that's taken him well, all the way to the left-hand side, unfortunately, straight to the scene of the accident. Uh, Kevin, Est Kevin Estra, uh, Yelma Berman, yes. Mike Rockenfeller. Uh, Quite right. Denny, yeah. uh, Dennis uh, Marshall hadn't been around. Uh, Darren Turner was certainly well over there in the Aston Martin, as was, uh, ironically, Jesse Crone, his Wolkenhurst Motorsport teammate. So we are looking uh, for a at least another few minutes. The track services team on site there doing an absolutely cracking job. Refastening the tile barrier in front of the steel arm court. And then, um, and then they've got to sweep the track, which is now wet, which means the dirt is now sort of a bit muddy, or from where I would say, uh, where I come from, a bit clarty. Yeah, but they've got, they've got this equipment that can come and oh, sweep yes. that dirt really good. And so they efficient. They're a sweeper here. there now, yeah, don't they? Really so efficient the way though, because the, those tyres have done what we said, it saved the barrier repair. Yeah. There's no real barrier repair there. It's putting the right. tyres back into place, and as ever, uh, so one thing you don't want to do on a tourist lap is do those because they uh, charge you no, for they it. They charge you per well per they meter. They charge you for meter of the barrier and they charge you for every minute 
they, they have to close the track. And the nuts and bolts and washers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. L literally, no, quite no, literally. No, no, absolutely. Line item. <laughs> yeah, line by line. Um, plus, I mean, you don't really want to do that in your road car anyway. No, uh, so not even... What? We will have to get a sweeper down there, Bruce, because shards of carbon fibre and racing tyres don't mix at all well. They never have. <laughs> they never will. But I, the more I think about that, because I just... When I just saw the puff of dust in the air, lit from behind, Good and I said, sport. whoa, early in the lap, going through Hatzenbach, Estra's on it. Your point, Peter, about Christian Cronus taking a safer line, I think he might have also just seen where the dust was sitting, so he decided to go wide, and then there was no rubber on the outside, yeah. and off he went. There was other dust from other elements there before. Yeah. But by the time he had about 10 cars between him and the Manti Porsche, surely the others would have swept, blown the rest of that dust clear, but I think he just went onto the outer line to avoid what was sitting there. Maybe in his mind, he was thinking yeah. my second yeah. flight. Yeah, let's less, less have two evils. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So he's trying to be careful, trying to be cautious, and uh, with big impact. But again, it stresses yet again. Oh, big clip on the kerb going into the left-hander before the right. There is no the way to hide, though, is there? And, and he was all four wheels on the block paving. Kyle Witt's a little bit further to the left. Then the team car barely yeah. um, keeping the wheels on it. And I, I it's the sheer amount of dust that is still on the outside of the circuit. That's not just from one driver no, 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 the no. curbs. Absolutely That not. is on the bit of the track that drivers try not to go on. It's accumulation of all the dust from earlier today, <laughs> plus all those pesky campers stamping up and down on the paths on the infield, kicking dust into the air, because it, I know it's been warm and dry who have been celebrating that, but certainly they've been doing all sorts of dances alongside the circuit well, by, the, by their campsites. If you take the picture uh, for Auto Trader, uh, other <laughs> sites are available from the uh, the right hand side. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Only uh, only three only three drivers barely used. Um, Squint and it's mint. It's good, it's good, yeah. <laughs> Going out through the old uh, pits and uh, those are the pits that are still used on uh, manufacturer days. If you uh, come and take the circuit, the old grandstand still there. Double back around to the old paddock. And they'll be back in for the number of days where we've been based in the pits that are on that short straight where you uh, come through to the end of the Nordschleife, then you turn hard right and do that short straight before the Sabina Schmitz curve, which the left, the first left hander as it goes down onto the start of the hats and back. Uh, great setup in there. Oh, now from race control, one lap only for this first part. So it has had a knock on effect, and that means it's one and done. So now I, I reckon, then I'll, I, I say now this is advantage to Estra and, and Kalvitz and possibly Mike Rockenfeller, who got further round the, the lap, Bruce, because they, they did more of the lap at, at full speed. 100% uh, correct. One little factor I'm just going to knit in. We saw the number 22 car collection Audi sitting in the pits for a short while with uh, Dennis Marshall. I presume that will be at the back of the queue. He's, he's only just returned to the pits now because uh, the last car theoretically in the line was the one that started 20th and last, the Pro Sport Racing the green and white Aston Martin, Mike David Ortman, but it was many minutes after that the 22 Marshall car came to the pits. Uh, on RSL underscore studio, a number of you saying that they were all going for it, and some of the cars, particularly the Aston Martin and the first of the BMWs, looking very loose earlier, uh, early on in the uh, lap. Uh, thank you for that. That was Roger Davies at Sabine Schmidt, Sabine Schmidt curve. Uh, and Snoody McFlood, hello Snoody, nice to know you're here at the moment. He said, I was at the kink just before Cron, uh, just before the area where Cronyers went off. He was really pushing it and had the grass on the exit of the right and the left before he exited stage left. So everybody on the limit here. Beautiful conditions, so the tyres will be coming up the temperature. In his case, he's Yorkerhamers. Now we'll go green and get the cars back out of the pit lane in about five and a half minutes, so they'll come back onto the start-finish line and we will repeat the countdown. But remember, it will still be one full prep lap, if you want to call it that, 
and but then only one flying lap so you're not going to burn as much fuel you will not get a second chance it's one and done who's got the advantage peter from this kevin estra totally agree at the moment at the moment um you obviously said both of you said instantly when it was red flagged it's fair um it's now got the advantage one and done that's uh if it, it, nothing else it's a psychological advantage yeah as if he needed one yeah as if as if but i just want to point out the initial maths i did proved that the car in second in that mm. line of cars daniel kalvitz in the number 20 ferrari was putting together a better lap by two tenths and that was the what about the three-quarter mark of the lap? Yeah, he would have been round about Stefan Belof S, maybe a little bit further yeah. back, Flansgarden. No, no, I reckon actually almost going to Schwalbenstrand because right. we had Kevin Estra when the red flag was thrown, just about turning into Galvenkopf. Right. And they would set off. So he thought there might be 30 seconds. It was more like 10 seconds between them as they he, set off. So Kalvitz in the WTM, the Vokspiegel team, Monschau by Rinaldi Racing Ferrari. He's done all the twisty bits as well. Yeah. He's done all that middle section. As soon as you've sort of come down the hill from Callanhard across the bridge at uh, Adenau, that next bit from there is where you make up a lot of time. And in particular, through from uh, Steilstrecker after the Caracciola Carousel in the Hoa Act, and then through Vipperman, Brunchen, Flansgarden, those areas are hyper quick. Peter, and that's if you've got confidence there and you know that the car was good on that first lap, you'll be pretty confident again. So much more so than the guys who never really got there at speed, surely. As you say, if you've got a good car underneath you, and that you said earlier about another part of the circuit, that area you described there of, of Vipperman, Brunchen, uh, Flansgarden, all the way through Stefan Beloff, Galvenkopf, yeah. onto yeah. the Dottinger Hoa, yeah. it's got a flow to it, it's metronomic. Awesome. If you've got a good car under you, that gives you confidence. And it's just that it, you don't even need to break that bit later. It's just that confidence that you know what it's going to do, how the car's going to work. We were just saying on the order of people here, I think also, I'd, much as I'd love to see Darren Turner do a great job here, it's not not a top, top car. One we do need to look at, though, for is the racing one uh, Ferrari that you've mentioned before, Bruce, of Johannes Stengel at the wheel of that. That's got some pace, that car. That's got the, some it pace. Could, it could surprise us. I'm not it sure could surprise he has the pace for that. He's still relatively... In GT3 yeah. terms... Can he be top five, though? Fairly new. Can, that's, that's all he's got there. to be to He's got go to be forward. top five. But I'm just thinking, now they know it's one flying lap. Mm. How you were talking, Peter, there about confidence. It's a long, 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 long lap. You've clattered the kerbs early in the lap. Can you keep your head together to put that behind you and just keep pressing on? Now, that's going to play into the hand to somebody like Darren Turner, yeah. who knows an Aston Martin inside, inside out. out. He can do this with blindfolded. Yeah. So, it might absolutely just be his perfect arena. Hello to Matt Hawkey Hawkins over in uh, Rushton in Northampton, right in the middle of uh, England. Uh, Grey on one side, blue sky the other, but no rain, which is very surprising, he says. <laughs> We've had no rain here either. Uh, Matt, thank you for tuning in. Sound and vision, live and free. And no blocks or breaks for this part of the week. Reminder, if you're in the North American region, USA, Canada, speedsport1.com. And... You'll be able to follow along on their app, but that is free. So make sure you don't miss anything. Audio is free everywhere, of course. So the uh, RadioLeMond.com and RS1, if you're travelling in the car at the moment. And a lot of Shami and David, who are on their way here, even as we speak. They did well in the higher car bingo game earlier on at Cologne Airport. And that looked like an Audi A7 that they were heading down this way in. Hopefully they're tuned in as well. One thing I think we t need to focus on, we touched on it briefly, is Conrad Motorsport even having a car coming out oh, to play. Point. Because yesterday, coming out of Galkenkopf, the merest of rubs along the side of a Porsche Cayman. And uh, uh, initially, the Lamborghini was on the right-hand side of the track. It snapped across the nose of the Cayman, slammed into the barriers after vaulting over the kerbs on the left-hand side of the track, came back across with... Uh, Bulgarian racer Pavel left her off for board and then the car was returned to the pits. Con Franz Conrad, 25 years and a bit more, 
rolled up his sleeves, they've rebuilt that car and it's out here to play. We've yet to see its hand being revealed, but it's top marks to those crews for getting that fixed. They said originally um, to our pit reporters that comes through on the, the live ticket, we don't think it's too bad, we'll get it sorted tonight. Um, it didn't come uh, back out last night, but it was out this morning in the qualifying session. Um, it was stripped down to pretty much everything off other than the engine coming out of the back of that or the middle of that Lamborghini. We could see every little bit of the rear subframe. Uh, all of the sub-assemblies had been taken off. New wishbones were going in on the right rear. Um, they were recycling the bolts, I've noticed. Um, and how very France. And... They've worked, I'm not sure what time they got away last night, but it, that will not have been an early night. But the car looked pretty decent in, in Q, uh, Q, Q3 this morning. Yeah, it didn't look bad at all. Right, so the car's now leaving the pit lane, John and, and Peter, working their way right back round to the grid, and they will do the same as before. They'll form yep. up on the grandstand side and set off in the order. I, the only ones I want to watch are Lauren Heinrich, who was sixth, I think, in the line. His timing sector seemed very weird on the screen. I don't know if there's a glitch with the timing. It looks like he did a bit of the lap and a bit more of the lap. But certainly Dennis Marshall ought to be at the very back. But not all the cars are yet out of the pit lane. The Huber Porsche time. is still being worked on. There is still time, but the restart of the session will be at 6.30 sharp. The flag will go up or down, who cares? Um, and then the first car will set off nine minutes flying lap. Now. And just to reiterate, John, it's one flying lap. Yes, it's the out lap and then bam. If you're tuning in now and expecting to see the Paul shootout and seeing some cars in here that you weren't expecting and not seeing cars that you were, then let me quickly recap on what's happened. We are rerunning the first part of the shootout in qualifying. Big accident for the number 102 Valken Horse Motorsport BMW M4 GT3, the Yokohama car, Christian Cronjes being caught out with a dirty track at the end of the hats and back, coming into quite heavy contact with the tyre wall on the left front of his car. The tyre's doing their job, but sort of almost sucking the car in and turning it at 90 degrees uh, to the direction of travel. I, I mean, another maybe half a metre, and he'd have got away with that. He, he just was clipping that, and he might if he'd just been, as I say, half a metre further over, even if he just brushed the tyres, but it was just strong enough contact to pull the front of that BMW in and nose it in. All the tyres moved, the, right, the left front wheel ripped off that car and the suspension, and that's going to be a lot of work for the Valkenhorst mechanics on the one or two side of the garage. So, it should be Kevin Estra at the front of the grid. He was the man and with the number 911 Manti EMA Porsche. I think it's still in the pits, though, round. John. I think it's still in the pits. They haven't got out yet. There's no. still time. And uh, we've got... I mean, it doesn't matter if they can go around the GP circuit and come on and just go past down the queue and pick up your place, Correct. can't you? Yeah. Correct. That they'll be all yeah, still sitting there. They'll be all. They're waiting for the last possible minute to bring the tyres out of the ovens, which are behind the garages. Multiple cars in each garage, so there's no room to have the tyres in their ovens warming in the garage. So they're out in awnings in the back. Five cars in that garage. Some have four. Uh, some. I think the most of Peter and I saw when we walked down. Was, did we have a six car garage at the pit in end? I think we possibly had a six, certainly a couple of fives. So Estra has to do it again, has to get the adrenaline going, has to get the focus going. But he knows this place like the back of his hand. Already seven of the cars formed up in number or not number order they're starting order on the grid but the clock keeps counting down we keep going again afresh at 6 30 local time so half the cars in the pit the others are going around the, the short cut around the grand prix loop and then let's see if we can not just get the cars up to speed but get them the whole way around just one flying lap this time and they've got to make it work 
So just over 15 miles is what awaits these now 19 drivers. And what we haven't been able to find out is why the number 22 Audi came into the pits for Dennis Marshall. Maybe just to give himself a clearer track. The combination of water and dust down near the accident has left the track with um, almost a sienna-coloured streak in them. Looks like we've had some kind of uh, street art on there. And that is going to be tricky, but they will get one go through that, at least to find where the grip is before they have to come round at full speed. Of course, all 19 cars have gone through before you start your, your fast lap, your, your flying lap, so hopefully that would have cleared it out. And you've just, you just got to put it to me. Kevin Nash is going to arrive at that yeah. and go through it and think, what the heck? Yeah, that wasn't like that. <laughs> that wasn't that happened yeah. there. No one told me. Did, did, did something happen? Was there a red flag? Why? Yeah. Anyway, carry on. And uh, you know, he'll go on the grass, won't he? No. I did say it was called Kevin Nash to pass on pass the grass. on the grass. Yes, but... Um, and he'll just dismiss it. Typical driver, just dismiss it, park it, carry on. Yeah. So, one flying lap here. But TQ2, so the pole shootout, remaining at the moment with two flying laps. Race control passing that information. That's at the moment. Um, things, a uh, little asterisk down to that is... Uh, Schedules can change. Indeed. Three and a half minutes to go until the first of these cars, 19 cars remaining, will aim for five remaining places in the final qualifying shootout. So even if you're fastest here, we might get totally focused on that. They've got, got to do it, to do it all, all over again. And, yeah. of course, the order will then be shuffled one more time. So say Kevin Estra sets the fastest time, he yeah. may be starting, gets through to the shootout, the final shootout for the top 19 cars. He could start that one last and have the sort of reverse position. Well, the car will. But yeah, it'll be of teammates. course, it'll be it'll Fred, be Fred Mac Mac Good point. So, yes. again, if you're just joining us, a reminder: you, you know, those in, in, uh, those in this session, you think, oh, well, they've they've got a big advantage because they've just driven. No, no, take the driver out, refill the car. The helpers asked to leave. The grid's being cleared, and therefore, I think they're allowed uh, one. No, they're not. They're clearing everybody, so the cars are going to have to start on their own. As yeah. they should do, proper insurance. Yeah, I, 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 you, you, I, you often ask me, John, what's going through a driver's mind at this point or yeah. whatever. And we're talking about there seeing the, the Grello 911, Kevin Astro car, wait to the very last minute to get those tyre yeah. warmers up to temperature. That said, he drives around, pulls it down the middle, parks at the front with three and a half minutes to go. Yeah. And honestly, it's just like he's gone to the shops, pulled it up, turns it off. Wait for it, got three minutes. Yeah. You'd think we'd be sitting there, tension. Keep the engine running, keep it going. No, just park, it'll start. It's a yeah. Porsche, it's fine. One crew member just for each of the cars, just uh, having a look round, making sure everything's all right, doors are closed, all the right bits that they want taping up are taped up. All the bits they don't want taped up. But this, this is the best bit when you've got this. You're getting, you're getting, okay, a second go at it, but you're getting effectively a free run of traffic on the Nordschleife <laughs> in a top GT3 car for the N24 hour tomorrow. Never mind tension, this is it, the bit, the bit before, a minute and 30 to go. You're sitting there thinking, right, come on, let's play. Let's get it fired up and let's go. You're going to get the Nordschleife to go and play on. This is why people become racing drivers. Yeah, show me a driver anywhere in the world yeah. that doesn't want to come and complete on a, a clear circuit. And so many drivers race here year in, year out, particularly in the oh. Nürburgring Langstrecken series. They never get a clear lap. Multi-class racing, but here we've refined it. The top two classes, SP9 and XPX, the experimental class, out here, the fastest cars of the entire meeting with this brilliant, brilliant stage on which to play. Calm, to calm before the storm. Take a and deep the breath, whistle, the right time. Everybody, <laughs> the whistle for uh, the second half, really. We haven't changed ends. Uh, we go again. <laughs> Uh, and we've got a two-lap shootout coming up for the pole position. Before that, we've got to fill the five remaining spots for the pole shootout. Five cars from now the 19 remaining will head into a top 19 for the pole position 
for the 51st running of the ADSA Total Energies 24 hours of the Nürburgring 2023. Green flag in hand at the front of the grid is still furled. Kevin Estra. Has he even started? I'm, I'm, four, just, that's what I'm trying to look for. 4.2 flat six of the number 911. He must have done. I don't think he has. Sitting a packed Mercedes Benz Arena. Yes, he had. But it was with less than 30 seconds to go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just how <laughs> calm. How cool is that? The yeah. Ferrari is running. Yeah, no need to spin the wheels, Daniel, which he didn't. He's pulling away as if he was pulling out of a supermarket car park, having done his weekly shop there, as you do in your 296. Third place, we'll tell you again. So it's Estra for Porsche, Daniel Karlovitz for WTM by Rinaldi Ferrari, Mike Rockenfeld underway for the number 40 Audi Sport team share, and then Conrad Motorsports, Yelma Berman in the Lamborghini, the earlier version of the Lamborghini. Lauren Heinrich for the almost sort of camouflage. It's like, we don't want you to see the shape of this car mm. as they pull away on that. They're, actually, that is all, if you look closely, it's all racetracks uh, on that car. Really nicely done. Then, uh, Dennis Marshall in the 22 car that came into the pits, whatever was ailing, ailing that. This might have helped them, actually, as they get going again. Door Motorsports, Black, Aston Martin has Aston uh, Specialist, uh, Darren Turner in that car. The Falcon Horse, remaining Falcon Horse 101 uh, is Jesse Cron. Then Huber Motorsport, the uh, light blue, sky blue, white and orange of Com Ledegar for Huber 25. First of the two GT2s, Thomas Jaeger and the 46 Team HRT car, mostly silver with a little bit of light blue on it. The 19 Racing 1, Johannes Stengel Ferrari. Fastest full lap that we've seen here. Not quite the fastest theoretical lap for the uh, transition spot. Then, Karl Grenier for Schnitzelheim Racing, the triple two. It's another Mercedes. My Matteo Caroli, Rutronic Racing Porsche in the blue and yellow livery. I think the man with the uh, green flags doing a great job walking up there. You would have thought they would have just trickled down towards him, wouldn't you? Uh, after that, it's Ricardo Feller for Audi Sport uh, PHX, Sharon PHX, the 16 car. No Christian Cronje, so there's a wee gap back to Alexander Sims in the R8 LMS Evo 2, the number five, the blue and white Sharon Sport PHX. Then Rover Racing's. Uh, we thought was Mark Wittman in that car rather than the declared driver of Sheldon von der Linde, didn't we? So Wittman in the 98. Fabian Schiller for Team Get Speeds Mercedes number two. The number one Audi is the penultimate car, Mattia Trudy. And then Pro Speed, uh, Pro Sport Racing, excuse me, Michael David Altman for the Aston Martin GT3. Here we go again. They're underway and increasingly. Uh as the very last car in the line, Mike David Altman blasts off. I think it is Sheldon van der Linde. I think it was a captioning glitch ah, okay. on the screen because I've, it's on the timing screens. It was on our initial list. So that would be the South African running 16th in the line of 19 remaining cars in that 98 Rover Racing uh, BMW. But as the cars go past hats and back, there is so much dust and, and dry up material on the circuit there. Kevin Estra kicking up. It's like he's on the Paris Dakar rally. Mm. Yeah, well, there is a 992 Dakar now as a streetcar. Uh, so with that much drying material on the circuit, yeah. that is going to be... And also the light's getting a little lower in the sky. It's If you're third in the line of cars going through there, you're going to get a complete face full. But the, the thing is, it's right in the trees there. And if that was water, the water spray would get thrown throw up and hang there. And that's exactly what's going to happen to the dust. There's not that much wind to speak about anywhere. But, I mean, Estra's got the best track at it in terms of what he can see or can't see. Oh, wheel spin through there for Matteo yeah. Caroli uh, and for... Michael Grenier in the car in front, got yeah. a real tail slide in one of the two uh, GT2 Mercedes. He pulls out the way, so Matteo well, Caroli gets a bit more clear track. But, well, uh, woof. The, the GT2 Mercedes um, could spin their wheels in fourth gear on a, a dry road anyway because of that, that, much, uh, that much power. So, per... Mickey Grenier 
he's going to have to be uh, very circumspect with the right foot there. And the problem about that, Peter, is it's not just the lack of grip at that part of the Hudson back. Your tyres are hot. So it's going to take you another couple of corners to clear those off at the very least. Just where you don't want it on the hats and back going on, you know, effectively you've started the roller coaster of the Nordschleife. You have just at the end of that then, so we've got the right hander, that's where you pick it all up. Shoulder band Linda going through it now, that is, it's filthy. It's like driving into a, into a field car park at an agricultural fair. And then you've got the left, and then you've got a little bit to clean the tyres off. But it's, again, you, what it does, it's, it's that confidence thing, isn't it? Are you going to have your tyres, there's, a, there's a, long, a longish straight where you go over, um, the flute plaques, and then you've got that exceptionally fast double uh, apex right-hander. Are you going to have grip back for that, is what I'm thinking, because you're climbing the hill there, and that's a, such an important set of corners, the double apex right and then the left-hander as you, you go up to the Swedish cross. I think, I think pretty well, because to be honest, you, you've got a right, a left and a right again after that, so you're putting a lot of load onto those tyres. You're going to clean them off fairly quickly, and that straight you talked about over the bridge there, we, we mentioned earlier, there is absolutely no runoff area. No, it is a, no. not even a ribbon no. of grass there. So you can't, what I'm saying is you can't be weaving there to try and clean your tyres off yeah. to get another run for that, because there's not, the safety net's been taken away, hasn't it, at this point? It really has been. Right then, uh, we are ready to do this again. Only the top five get a second go, and the drivers will have to be replaced, the tyres will be replaced, and the fuel tanks will be topped up if they go through. They are much, much closer together on this run as Kevin Estra is leading them out over to the far side of the circuit into the Caracciola carousel. It's been a bit of a place change because Yelman Berman is third in the line. He started fourth in the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. He's going close to the tail of the car in second place, the WTM by Rinaldi Ferrari of Daniel Karlovitz. And probably half of the original gap to Kevin Estra has come down, but Kevin will have the clear track ahead of him. He's at the front of the queue. I, I would submit to the court of public opinion and you two gentlemen that Estra is nowhere near on it at the kind of level that he was on his on his first absolutely agree for well, why because he's already done it at full speed this is his parade lap effectively working around he, as we talked the first handful of drivers he'd done all the twisty bits he was just about to turn out a gal from cop and that leaves the easy long straight dotting a her but uh, Ke uh, right now kevin estra in the man type porsche is starting to wind it up and is, it, is, is this here that just at brunchen now so is this a different tyre prep as well, Peter, because he knows he's only got one go at it. He, he doesn't have to save anything for the second. So is he bringing the tyres in in a different way? Most likely so, because you say you haven't got that second run, you haven't got a two bit, so he wants them absolutely optimum for this one run. So it's, it's completely focused now uh, on this one, one, one run. And he's got to get it absolutely millimetre perfect for this, this, this one go. Just hearing, by the way, that Christian Cronius is back in the pits and talking to his team. And the quote that I have, is, have uh, here is, he seems to be doing well so far given the circumstances. Well, that's very, very good news indeed after what was a pretty, pretty heavy impact there. So, Kevin Estra, let's see what he does in the last part of the lap. He got to about halfway down the run to the Gallows Hill corner. Round about where he's turning in now to the first part of what is really a, a triple apex corner to go on to the long straight Dottica Hur. And now he's picking the pace up. But of course, your tyres going in a straight line, Peter, your tyres actually cool down, even if he's speeding up. Yeah, watch him weave a little bit in a minute. He'll start to pick it up, certainly after the kink. Right, just before it gets really dramatic, news of another Porsche. It's running fifth in the line. We saw the yellow and black camouflage uh, dynamic Porsche of uh, Lauren Heinrich. It's not coming up on our timing screen. Remember, I thought it had a transponder ah. problem, which gave it sort of suggested it didn't do sectors one, two, and three. It did four and five and then eight and whatever. So that may be an anomaly we have to look out for. But right. the serious bit is about to start now. Either that or he knows some very cool shortcuts. Yeah. Now, Daniel Kelvitt uh, in the, uh, the Rinaldi... Uh, Ferrari behind did do exactly all right on key what we said, started weaving to get heat into yeah. those 296 tyres. Kevin Estra did not, he, he did just stayed not. in a straight line. Here's Estra then, crosses the line now and the lap starts as he heads down towards the first corner. Remember, it's just the right-left flick 
that we use in the 24 hours. Karlovic was, to me, even by eyes, he went past our global broadcast centre. Sounded like he was going quicker. The engine was certainly pulling. So Estra goes all the way out to the right-hand side as he starts to plunge downhill through the... down to the uh, Goodyear S's and the Goodyear hairpin at the bottom of the hill. Quite steeply downhill here. Your breaking point is the entry and exit road on the right-hand side, right at the end of that. Now hard on the brakes and get the car turned in. Tries to get the nose of that car in. Kalvitz has dropped far enough back so he's not in the disturbed air. Then there's quite a big gap to third in line. That's the Conrad car of Yelma Berman. Purple so, again straight away for Kevin Estra. So Berman has got ahead of Mike Rottenfeller there. Yeah, but who's quicker in the first sector? Again, it's Kyle Witz. I yeah. think it just looked more dynamic. Maybe Kevin uh, Kevin Estra it, feels his tyres are going to come it, in it further It almost, almost looks circumspect, doesn't yeah. it, Estra? Yeah. Which I never thought I'd say with Kevin Estra in the same centre. Let's say, got to leave the room now for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Sacrilegious. Coming to the end of the Grand Prix lap. This in any other form of motor racing and qualifying you'd be thinking, right, let's just get the next two corners right, and uh, and then I'm home and dry. No, not here. You're and then there's the dust. The dust is about to be seen this for is the second time at full correct. charging speed. Kevin Estra going through between Sabine Schmidt's Eintz and Zwei, and then he's going to go down the hill and turn a couple of right-handers, and then we'll find out where the dust is like. So this is onto the hats and back for the lead car, drawn by Lott, picking up the speed from the... Pace, now he comes into the dirty area, he's on the grass again, big sideways oh, moment, yeah. and the back end is out, it's like a drift car through there, and again he's on the uh, he's on the block paving, Karlovic has closed up massively through there, but that was a huge sideways moment, and for Yelma Berman in the Lamborghini as well. Right, in the first two timing sectors, uh, Daniel Karvitz has taken nearly eight tenths of a second out of the advantage Kevin Estra has by running up front, but the replay is showing no dust, no dust, plenty of dust, and then Kevin Estra getting into a monster wobble coming out of the, the front of the he, car was just washing away. He wanted to get the power down. Oh, my word, that was a great save. He, he, but I don't think he lifted there. That was just... He was controlling that with the steering wheel and a tiny bit of the right foot. He's steering with the throttle, trying to go through the middle. He's sideways for probably half a second there. But what he did is he took all that right-hand curb on the way again, unsettled car. The car dropped off the curb quite hard, which didn't help, but then it got on the dust and then he got the power in. So it's blur of physics, it's just, it was going to, but it's, it just kept it. So now coming to the end of the foxhole, down one gear through the right-hander into Adenal Forest. Down another gear, turn in for the left-hander. Start to build up, wait, wait, wait. Now on the throttle, now on the throttle. That's first gear out of there. Pulling through. Only one gear down this time. Yeah, he only went Last one. Time, two yeah. gears down. Correct. He's being, he's being careful. He doesn't want the ball up the car, but yeah. can he get through? But why is he being careful? This one flying lap. When you have yeah. two, you can afford to take more risks. Yeah, right. This time he's held a little bit back. So this is only to get through to the final qualifying shooter. Don't forget, this is 19 guards going to the final five places. Really tough corner at Callan Hard. Now, following on behind Mark, Mike Rottenfeller onto the dirty part of the circuit, and he's half a car's width wider than everybody else. And that, when well, he was spinning his wheels, there was no forward traction at all. He's right into the dirt. I'd say he was a full car's width wider than everybody else at that point, gents. Well, I think anyone else coming through is behind is going to say, thank you, you've cleared a bit more of the dust yeah. that yeah. the cars haven't touched as yet. Now, down towards the bridge at Adnau. Again, look for the road coming in from the right-hand side. That's your breaking point. It's all been resurfaced relatively recently. No change of surface going up the other side into the Mickey Louder kink, the left-hander coming up just over the top of the brow, can't quite see the apex of it, and the light has changed, of course, it's more dappled here as they head in towards, uh, in towards Bergwerk. Be patient there, now, climbing, climbing all the time. Do not be greedy here. You can come from the middle of the road, you want as little lock on as possible, because you're pushing against gravity as you're going up the hill. The third part of this left hand, this left hand has tightened in on you and there's no runoff on the right hand side. Still flat, still flat, keeping it all pinned to the floor now as you pull up the hill. You cannot use the curbs 
on the left hand side as you come through mud curb it looks like the wall there was a little lift there and another little shimmy of the steering wheel from kevin estra stay off the curbs there kevin and now comes to the left the right hander at the bottom of the hill before the caracciola carousel and while kevin estra is pressing on so hard daniel carvitz has taken almost half a second off his advantage at the moment he is faster in the second car in that run it's the number 20 wtm ferrari so as spectacular as kevin estra is in the le latter part of the lap i think advantage ferrari i think he's struggling for front grip here he, he is a little most bit definitely. late even into the carousel trying to drop in there and that wouldn't have been comfortable, that doesn't really matter, but that means he's losing time. It's, just, it's, not, it's not turning in, as soon as he turns in, it's getting a little bit of snap understeer. You can see he's having to fight it over every the, time. Over the top of Vipperman, and dropping down. These are very quick corners, and you need a good front end on the car. Kylovitz again, a good set of splits. He's just about the right sort of distance behind that he's not being slowed down. Meantime, Estra comes down through the left-hander uh, before Brunchen. All of the block paving on the outside, exit of Brunchen, and he'll do the same again. That's really two flat piece of curve through the ice curve now, climbing up over the top of the brow onto Flans Garden. Should be flat through there, and he wasn't. Maybe took a little bit too much curve on the right-hand side. John, you've been talking all meeting. So far this year, these brand new Porsches don't seem to be really strong in the straight line. Well, how do we end this lap with a massively long straight in the Ferraris? The 296 GT3s seem fantastic. And bear in mind that already Daniel Carvitz is about half a second up on him. Now into the Stefan Belos, Stefan Belof S. Down through the gearbox for the number 911 Manti car. Into Again, well, again mid corner by the apex there. No, he, he's just washed out. It's awful. It's awful to watch. That's a it? that's a pig to drive that that Porsche. I wonder what they've done to make the difference. Is it just the, the change in track temperature, different tyre pressures at the start? They were keen on keeping the heat in the tyres, Peter, but something's not right. That does not look the same kind of confident Kevin Estra because that front end. It isn't talking to him, is it? It's, it's, it's shunning him at the moment, and it's not going where he wants it to go. And we're talking about fine margins here, but it's, it's just not happening. Karlovic will not be far away from getting a tour there, coming down the Dottinger Hall, round about three or four seconds back. You start to pick up an aerodynamic tour, and Karlovic, at the moment, is going very well indeed, Bruce. He really is, but in fact, oh yes, just as he get, he lost a little bit in comparison to Kevin Estra before they, in the longest sector of the track, which comes into Schwalbenschwanz and then onto the straight, but actually down the next sector, the Ferrari, we said it was sleeker, and he's gained a few more tenths back, so coming into the final street through the tier garden, the right, the left, onto the start, finish straight, the first line lap will go on the board, what is it for Kevin Estra? An 11.7. 11.7, what's it going to be from Daniel Carvitz? It must be quicker. An eight, in, an eleven zero, zero. zero eight yeah. tenths. Of, I'll be tenths. honest. I thought it would be a bigger gap than I that. Thought, I thought it'd be over a second. Yeah, me too. So that was a better but lap got, than we thought. He got that first half second in the, in the first half of the lap. Six days, yeah. Well, on the on the Hudson back, he, he took a half a second and more. Right, Yelma Berman is the third one across the line. He's an eight sixteen point one. He's five seconds down. So it's uh, Daniel Carvitz leading the way. Lauren Heidrich with the transponder problems comes through next. He goes into third, eight minutes fourteen. But it's it's not these times right now that we're worried about. It's from fifth on down. Remember, these count for nothing. We wipe the slate clean when we go at the top qualifying to the shootout for Paul. This time it's meaningful. And basically, these guys just want to be in the top five. They don't need to bring, break the lap record right here, Peter. They need yep. to be in the top five. Right, we've had six cars now. So we can see people who aren't going forward. And one that isn't going forward is Darren Turner, who's just come through. 10 seconds off the ultimate pace so far, so it wasn't coming to him. And also the 101 BMW not in the hunt as well. Listen as Christian Kronjers. So did he jump into that no, car as well? Jesse Kron. Uh, Jesse Kron. Of course it's Chris, Jesse Kron, the sister yeah. car from Auckland Horse Motorsport. These three-letter acronyms. So they will be in it. Come let a guard goes to sixth position. So he is out. At the moment, Yelma Berman for Conrad. The car that was in pieces last night and overnight is on the bubble with Thomas Jaeger next to come across the line. Then we've got the number 19 Ferrari 
as well. Here comes Jürgen, this is a GT2 car. I can't imagine this one troubling the top of the timings, no. Johannes Stengel with an 8.20. Matteo Caroli, is he gonna get into the top positions? It's not a bad time. Yes, he goes to third. He goes to third. So that now puts Lauren Heinrich in the Porsche number 54 on the bubble. But right. still Grenier to come. To get through into the top five, the final five to move up, you've got to do an eight minute, eight minute 14.3 or lower the fastest time in eight minutes 11.023 fabulous from daniel kylevitz but ricardo fella goes top eight minutes 10 top. zero a whole second faster for the number 16 audi i look oh he's getting better and better the swiss race heinrich out and that means the next car in uh, in danger is the denny marshall car now that car remember came into the pits to start with so that whatever changes they made it helped them and they're bumped immediately. And Alexander Sims puts two Audis in top two positions, so Man. it's going well for him. They're the only cars, these two Audis, 16 and 5, in the eight-minute tens. Well, we had three Audis at the front at Spa for the 12-hour race from Creventic a few weeks ago. Here comes Fabian Schiller. It's a good time. It's good enough for fourth. And that means Caroli is out. And Kevin Estra is on the bubble. Surely he's not going to go out. Here comes Sheldon van der Linde. No, he's well down. He must have had a problem in the Rover Racing BMW. He's 22 seconds off the pace. Trudy, this could be dangerous. And he's popped out the, the Manti car. Is he driving an Audi? Yes, there he is. Oh, my goodness. The Manti car is bumped out to sixth position. Kevin Estra, too conservative, or perhaps a mistake. Now, what happened to the Rover BMW to lose all of that time off the track, off the tack track after Vipperman? Huge sideways slide at one of the few places where you can have a bit of a runoff, but he clipped the barriers on driver's left. The difference between that and Cronje's uh, mistake at uh, Hudson back was one more room to try and get it back and two he clipped it more square and with the rear first rather than the front otherwise that was another big shunt for a BMW no. Sheldon van der Linde early for the drift show Take, yeah. taking, the, taking the left hand mirror off as well the driver's mirror off. that's a full code brown mare for yeah. Sheldon van der Linde <laughs> Right, all the drivers have set a time. We have five positions that are claimed, the five positions to go through. Ricardo Feller in the number 16. Audi takes bragging rights. Then Alexander Sims. Daniel Karvitz was mighty in the Ferrari. He's third. But the big story here is the Manti 911 Porsche Corello will start in 20th position tomorrow. Uh, actually, uh, yes, in 20th position because he's the first non-qualifier. and We've got 19 to come. So, my goodness, mate. So, what have we got at the top? Audi, Audi, Ferrari, Mercedes, and Audi. Those are your top five. Share a sport, share a sport. WTM by Rinaldi, Mercedes, uh, AMG team get speed, and share a PHX again. Three Audis in transfer spots. So, those teams now have to do rock, paper, scissors at the back of the uh, pit to select their second driver, another set of their tyres to go on and top it all off again. Wow, absolutely extraordinary. It's a very, very long lead in. It's very, very dramatic. And of course, with that collision for Christian Cronjers, we had to go to reset, we had to go to default, we had to go to one flying lap. I love the format, I didn't so much enjoy the accident down there, but uh, glad Christian is back in the garage. So, we just see to go through to the final qualifying session of the 51st 24 hours. So, part two to come. Uh, Peter Snowden, some thoughts from you, but the, I mean, the, the story is, right now, we don't know who's going to be Paul. There'll be 19 cars fighting out for it. But right now, the headline is no Manti in the Paul shootout. I just, I, well, can you just say that again? No yeah. Manti. <laughs> Hang on. I'm sorry. It's, I, I'm, it's, yeah. It sounds quite sensationalist the way I'm seeing it. But I, it is. Honest, I honestly thought that yeah. they, they would certainly get in the top five. And being first, we thought it would be an advantage. Maybe it wasn't with all that dirt there. But there was a completely different look to that car with Kevin Estra behind the wheel, he's already looking at his data, he's talking to 
the uh, engineering team on the pit wall. Where did I lose? What did he miss out on? He missed out by about a tenth of a second. Maybe a tenth and a half. I just, I mean, there's over, a t over 25 There's a kilometers. tiny temperature change. They've got to refuel the cars. That's not yep. a fuel issue. So that's going to be the same. There's a little bit of temperature change. You've been on it. We saw it, that body language of that car, that first run. It wasn't the same. We saw how much it was using yeah. the curb. It, yeah. was all, it looked like what you'd expect, a qualifying lap. And then it just didn't. And you and I were, and Bruce was in there. Are we seeing this? We, I think none of us wanted to verbalise it because you couldn't quite believe it. Mm. But then the set to time started coming in and it just didn't seem to have the Paced. and it was, there's definitely something wrong with the front end of that car. He could not turn that in. So no, what can no happen so much there. in that time? Amazing. I can't wait to see the quartz. Uh, Peter, thank you. Johnny Palmer and Peter Mackay now step in. Well, we've given you something to talk about. <laughs> uh, let me let me just wipe the blackboard clean here of all those. So all of those times that we've just seen, JP, they're now they stand for nothing. Yeah. We we start from zero again, and we have a second crack at this. But this time, it's for keeps. This is for pole position and for a top 19 position. We know the car starting in 20th, and that's Mantai's Grello 911. And that's going to be a headline all over the radio and local TV. And that's going to reverberate around motorsport world as well. The question is now, what we've seen from the Audis, can they translate that? The same drivers can't go, no. but they'll be passing on really important information to their teammates. You would hope so. Yeah, that's a, a really important briefing that's going to be happening now over the next few minutes. But quite right, driver has to change, fuel tank has to be topped up, tyres have to be changed. That's mandatory as well. But why wouldn't you change yes. a set of tyres? As my understanding, you don't get an extra set when oh, you really? qualified into Q2. It's 116 total tyres, that's 29 sets, irrespective of whether you're involved in both top qualifying one and top qualifying two. So, you know, yes, you get a big bonus in that you can shoot, as you say, for the overall pole position, but you've got to find an extra set of race tyres, basically, to do it. So that's advantage Manti for the race tomorrow because they've got one brand new set of tyres that everybody else doesn't have. There are you, go. you missing <laughs> the biggest story here, though, John, in that no, there are no Porsches that have progressed from that session. It's not just Manti, it's the Kai Riley 96 car as well, Good and point. who had the big bop change <laughs> heading into... Q3 and top, uh, top qualifying one, that was Porsche. Extra 20 kilos, the rake change. Yes, all of the drama that involved the crash for Christian Krognes, but arguably Kevin Estra was in the strongest starting position. I know he had to judge the road and actually acted as a bit of a sweeper like you get in rallying in that, you know, the more yes. cars that go through yeah. there, the better it gets because they're taking the top surface Tra off. Track position is not necessarily your friend uh, in that you're doing a bit of road sweeping. So no Porsches progressing, three Audis, a Ferrari and a Mercedes going through Peter Mackay. However, we have got Porsches that had automatically, they'd already got through. The two Falcon cars, 33 and 34. The Lion Speed, uh, number 24, Porsche. So the Visac brand, the uh, Visac Racing brand, is represented there. But is this bridge too far for for the rear-engined cars in this new 4.2? 992 GT3R. Well, we're about to find out, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, you, you can't really ask much more than a driver of Kevin Estra's caliber. Kevin's a, 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 you know, he's a real athlete, and he was bathed in sweat when he came out of that car. He's only done two laps. Mike Rockenfeller talking about huge the, oversteer. Yeah, huge oversteer. Well, which I, I would think he's talking about going through the the dirt <laughs> section, the rally cross section, should we call it? Um, and I think I totally agree with Johnny. That was the first thing I thought, thinking you want to be further to the back here. You do not want to be the first couple of cars through, clearing that muck away. Um, so, yeah, who would have thought we'd be talking about road cleaning? It's uh, this, this is my wearing mother hat. So, why might we now see in this se session guys who are at the front actually slowing down on their start-up lap and allowing people to go through. Where do you want to be? Fifth or sixth? Somewhere like that. You don't want to be behind someone who's going to slow you down. But it was a huge sideways moment. Lots of curb. Too and much it, curb it, I think too much curb, JP. I, yeah. I like what uh, 
Peter Snowden said about it. And, but the Ferrari, Kalvitz did pretty much the same. But for some reason, it was going well. But the second Porsche that went through there was all over the place. It was hopping, and you never want to see a 911 hopping around. It's not good for it. It's not good for it at all. Christian Cronje is going through uh, into the dirt and smashing the left front. That's a lot of work. Reiterate that. That's yeah. why we had the, the delay. Two laps, though, here. What's, what's the strategy? Do you put the banker in or do you just do one and done and pull in at the end of it? it it's a really interesting dilemma for me because the, the full tank thing is a new for 2023 rule. Your tyres are best on the first run, yeah. but the second run, you've got a lighter car. You've burnt some of the fuel off, so, you know, tyres have lessened in performance, but arguably the car's in a, a better state because you've burned, what, 24, 25 kilometres of worth of fuel off it. So, it's certainly a banker for me, just in case, you know, you might get another stoppage, and they might say, that's it, you've only had one. Yeah, that, that is so, a good point. So, keep it nice and clean. Then a slightly lighter car, you know, I don't quite have as much rubber to lean on, but you could arguably push a bit harder uh, next time around. I mean, we're also much later on in the evening yeah. than we originally planned to be on the schedule. Uh, no danger, really, of proper sunset, but it's, it's improving the atmosphere for me, you know, because the, the mood is just slowly gathering pace. There's going to be an inquest at Moist Path tonight uh, they'll not be dancing in the streets they are uh, down at uh, Milner racing remember we've set the other grid positions for everything outside the top 39 and congratulations to Milner and to Marcel Duke who's tuning in for the top qualifying Paul in the cup two class for the one two three car nicely done uh, for those guys and uh, Marcel part of the Radio Show Limited listeners collective uh, so we we feel a little bit part of that one. Well done, Marcel, and the rest of the team. Uh, what was it that Alex Brundle described, Marcel? He's he's the man who fixes stuff, puts things right. Uh, and uh, I suggested to Alex Brundle that uh, what one you've done something wrong. He went, yeah, yeah. I mess it up. He fixes it. So slightly more cloud cover again. Uh, we're by no means running out of daylight. It's. Uh, between quarter past and 20 past nine, official sunset. But yeah. this is a good, what, 45, 50 minutes later than we were expecting this to kick off, JP. Yeah, it was meant to be 5.30 till 7.15, I think, originally on the schedule, and we're now just two minutes after seven o'clock, and we haven't even started top qualifying two yet. Probably going to be about a 45-minute session or so. The one thing I thought, I just took a little break out at the back and came uh, back into the booth. There is more cloud cover, as you say, yeah. but it's actually quite dark cloud mm -hmm. as well, and the temperature's dropped. I haven't seen a recent forecast, but you know what this place is like? You might get the odd corner that's... I don't. don't a, a little even, wetter than others, we say. Even. I'm not talking about actual rain, just uh, some moisture don't. in the air, you know. Uh, Marcel Duke described himself as the, uh, p the problem guy, as in the person that solves them. That was the, uh, okay. the phrase. Thank you to the... Uh, to the responsible adult for reminding me of this. Uh, right, what do we know about the running order here, gentlemen? Have we got the running That's order? That's the sheet I, I am missing at the moment, and I'm desperate right. to know, because the draw will have been done. It's done in advance sure of the we'll top five those. going in. Um, and then what they do is they just hop, kind of, they are placeholding positions um, for those extra five cars that we can then... I, I, I did see the, the grid that says it, it's it's a bit like um, when you have a, a tournament, a football tournament, and it's um, Group it's A winner green. goes oh, yeah, into yeah. a quarter final with group B, uh, group B fourth, you know that sort of thing. They were slotting those in, so it, it's going to be the Christopher Haase Audi. Um, uh, we're not sure who's going to be driving that. The two Chris's along with Patrick Niederhauser. So the number 39 car is first, then the Fricadelli Ferrari second, presumably with Nicky Katzberg. I know it's with Nicky Katzberg. I spoke to him earlier. Right. Yeah. Uh, then, the, uh, then the number two Mercedes team get speed. Uh, that's the Christodoulou, Gutz and Fabian Schiller car. Uh, then fourth off will be the 
16 car, which is the Share of Sport PHX Audi. Uh, then in fifth is the number three. That's the Green Hell car. And it'll be Maro Engel, uh, the 22-year-old racing driver, on his first visit to this as he was trying <laughs> to sell that to us on Thursday. We're not buying what you're selling, but we know that he is going to qualify the car. Then the number 99, that's the uh, Farfus saying to Philippi and Nick uh, Yellowly machine. That's the, uh, what is that? The one, two, three, four, five, sixth machine for Rover Racing. Behind them will be in seventh, the 27, which is the Abt Sport line, the all black uh, Pro Lamborghini Huracan. In eighth, the 33, that's the first of the. Uh, Falcon tyres Porsches. Then it's teammate in ninth, the 44. So those two cars running together. Then in 10th, so just about halfway through, it'll be the number six. That's the Mercedes AMG Tim Bilstein uh, machine. Uh, and then. Oh, have you got some drivers there as well? Sorry. Yes, I do. Uh, you've, so the, the Falcon drivers we know. Yes, which will be in the 33 car will be uh, Alessio Peccarello and in the car number 44 will be Nico Menzel okay. for the Falcon cars. So where did, where did we get to? Uh, I think I got the 6, the 20, did I mention the 24? No, the 24 is 11th. That's the Porsche uh, Lion Speed machine. And then in 12th, it's the number 5. That is the Share Sport car that includes Renger van der Zander, Alex Sims, Frank Stippler, Vincent Kolb. So Alex can't do that because he's Correct. just been out in, in P1. Uh, then the number 100 Falcon Horst car, and that was the one that had already qualified through, uh, and that is the uh, Pro-Arm car for Sammy Matty Trogan, Christian Brolrath, Jörg Breuer, and Henry Falcon Horst. 11th is the number 14, which is the Share of Sport Audi, that's the Schramm, Beretta, Winkelhock and Ricardo Feller car. And I'll let you do the last couple, Peter, if you don't mind. So, the, uh, for that one, where did you get to number five? Are you up, are you further up? Oh, you're ahead of me. Oh, you're fast. Number, car number one, uh, Frederick Verwisch, uh, Matteo Judy, Ricardo Feller and Dennis Lind. They're one of the drivers that got in. In fact, they got in just three Audi Scherer machines all getting into that top five. So Scherer PX... Uh, PHX very happy indeed. Uh, car number 10 of Treff's Hire, Bachmann and Marchevitz. That's one of the Schnitzel Alm yeah. cars. That's a yes, car as they're, well. they're pre qualified already. They're, they've, uh, they've had a more relaxing time than some of the others have had uh, as well. Then it's car number 20, Vockenspiegel Team Monto. I would say one of the hero cars of the day, Vice Krumbach, Calvis and Indy Doncha. Then car number 72, one of the favourites for Paul, I would say. Uh, car number 72 is Daniel Harper, Max Hess and Neil Verhagen. Again, already automatically qualified. And then finally, going off 19th and final car in this top qualifying two session, Raffaele Marcello, Lucas Stolz, uh, Phil Ellis and Eduardo Montaro, car number four. Which is the Tim Bielstein, the, ha the painted car. Yes. Some of it hand Yellow painted. A uh, yeah. couple of minutes. Race controller just telling us, in fact, one minute to go to the qualifying session. I'm not moving, but we'll leave you, because I want to watch this, but hmm. th this is pole position for the 51st running of the ADSC Total Energy's 24 hours of the Nürburgring. It's the 2023 edition. And taking you through this will be Peter Mackay. And first, here's Johnny Palmer. Well, it's quite a scene as the cars are now back on the apron and raring to go, some of which will not be taking part in this final or final qualifying, if you like. We've already had uh, top qualifying one to determine the SP9 and SPX grid from 20th position and rearward for that uh, first starting group that could contain as many as 70-odd cars. But it's all about, essentially, the front 10 rows now and in which order they qualify in. The six car had already made it in. That's the Hubert Haupt, uh, Jordan Love and Arjun Miney car because it, through a very complicated system of 
uh, top five split times, averaging them out and creating a theoretical time that doesn't actually exist. But because the six car was quicker uh, once you've done that calculation than the number 20 Ferrari, it was put in as the pro-am element of, uh, of transitional cars from Q1 to Q2. And that was done before this first session. It was done at the end, in fact, of qualifying one, two and three, those standard parts of the last two days. So we already had car six in, probably Argent Miney, I'm it thinking. Is, yeah. We know that for yep. a fact, thank you. Yep, seen, the, seen his helmet. Starting from 10th in the lineup. And I was also trying to work out where the cars that finished in the top five in Q1 slot in. I've certainly got as far as the number five share of sport Audi, which will be 12th in the line. The number one Audi, Mattia Drudi, did the time, so he can't be part of qualifying two. He'll be 15th. The Wockenspiegel team, Monchard by Rinaldi Racing Ferrari of Daniel Kajlovic, starting in 17th position. Stippy is uh, in his car. Frank Stippler yeah. will go 12th. 12th place instead of Alexander Sims, who did the qualifying to get the car into this all-important session. But again, Peter Mackay, it's about where you actually want to start in the queue. You are going to get two laps here if all things go to plan, but I'd probably rather not. But even though it's the Audi Quattro liveried uh, 39 Audi, so that's probably ideal quattro. for the for the water splash uh, part way around the lap at hats and back. Well, I do wonder if if the uh, the marshals have been able to get in there and get maybe do a little bit of clean up in this brief gap between top qualifying one and top qualifying two. They may have well just left it as is. We'll see. At least the drivers do get a sight lap, a full sighting lap of the whole North Slifer. So they do get a run through, they get a feel of what the grip level is like or what it what it's not like, it uh, is maybe more accurate to say. But this is what we've been waiting for all, all week. This is what we've been building up to. Many of the teams, I think, have got, have been keeping their absolute finest bullet in the gun for this two lap shootout. And this is what it's about. A couple of quick quotes from that first uh, session. Uh, Daniel Kailovitz saying my top quality one was great, made it into the second quality. It was very slippery, the hats and back, very difficult. The question is always what risk you dare take. You don't, you don't want to crash the car, but third place and entry into TQ2, that way, great, it's job done. Uh, we had Marcus Winkelhoff saying it's all about tomorrow, the car seems to work. Uh, top time in TQ1 in the hats and back today. Uh, it, the guys who uh, went onto the track a little later did have it easy, but Ricardo excelled in all sectors. Uh, who else have we had? Matteo Drudy, pretty hectic. One lap in Q2 was our goal anyway, so that's what we were going to do from now on. It'll only get better. Uh, there were a lot of strong cars out there. Alexander Sims said it was just great, a real privilege. A privilege, I like that, Alexander, to have a flying mm. lap here without any traffic. I've qualified for TQ2. Frank Stippler has now uh, taken up the baton. The balance of the Audi was wonderful. Just my second race with this car, and I felt at home from the first few metres. Very dusty in the hats and back, and I was lucky, because I got to, I was the first car to go through there after the accident. I did get a puncture, and Ooh. therefore, the qualifying session would have been over had it not been red flagged. Great that I got a second chance. So that was Alexander. Uh, Sims and uh, Fabian Schiller went quite well. The red flag made it a bit more difficult. Short hour maximum, not much more left in the car, but we enter TQ2. Might be, I think we'll be strong uh, in the car. That's the number two Mercedes over a race distance. So good intel coming up uh, from our reporters in the pit lane. Now, looking at the, the lap times, the lap, qualifying lap record, it was set in 2018 by Lawrence Vantor in the Manti Porsche, an 809.105. Now, the fastest lap time we saw in top qualifying one, that uh, shoot out there to get the uh, five cars going through, an 8.010 flat, an 8.10 flat, excuse me, which is pretty much on the pole time of last year. So with a full fuel tank, as Johnny says, uh, a, a new regulation, wow, that is uh, that is going quick. So I think we could see, particularly with an ever so slight drop in track temperature, I think you could not get better conditions to go for that record than we have right now. We were speculating, guys, about how long it took to clean the tyres up. Mike Rockenfeller said, that was chaotic. I was surprised we were released on the track with the track in that condition. 
the guys at the front had a major disadvantage. It was more slippery for them than for those that followed yeah. on. I took a full risk. I went too far out to the left, trying to keep up momentum, but that put me in the even slippier area. After that, the tyres, particularly the front tyres, didn't have grip for quite a few corners. I lost the car in Adenauer Forst. Uh, I was lucky that I wasn't uh, uh, off the track, and now we'll have to catch up the field from behind. Adenauer Forrest's a long way away from the end of the hats and back. If he was mm. uh, saying that he was still struggling yep. at, at that point. So those drivers will have been talking to each other. They'll be trying to glean information uh, and find out what they can do. The only thing I think about that part of the track is there's not much chance to scrub the tyres because it's pretty much flat all the way from Hocheichen through Flugplatz and, you know, you're feathering the throttle up towards Schwedenkreuz. Big stop at Arenberg, but that's not a place to start weaving. And then you're down uh, into the foxhole. Yeah. I'm where the tyres are still, uh, but you know, certainly not in, t in the prime spot and trying to ask the car to stop as you re-emerge into the clearing there at the bottom of the hill in, into Adenauer Force. I would I mean, uh, can you imagine that fluke platch? You've, that's the second corner after that sort of dirt section, as we now call it. Uh, can you imagine that coming into fluke platch, you know, fifth gear really, really fast through there, and you know you've got muck on your tyres. I'd certainly, as soon as I saw that in that top qualifying session, that mucky area from the cleanup uh, after the Vulcan horse car went off, I thought this is going to be like a gravel rally um, because the, the cars cleaning the road are going to sweep away the, the loose surface and, and leave the grippy tarmac underneath. I think one of the problems, guys, was that there was damp there as well from the water. So when they put the ah, so sweepers sticks. on, yeah. it's actually just spread it out. Yeah. You could see the lines where the road sweeper had gone backwards and forwards and it was almost like somebody had cut the grass, you know, and you have those lines on your grass. Yeah. Three minutes to go, so the clock uh, continuing to tick down and the atmosphere, the tension is certainly building. We are missing the number one, no, the number 30 uh, car. That's in position, it's fine, breathe again. Uh, probably El Bamba. Oh, no, Nicky, Nicky Katzberg, Katzberg yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. In interestingly, yeah, Nick, Nicky Katzberg, I mean, he's been the guy putting in the really hot laps in that car this week. The Frickadelli team are really relaxed. They're in a really good frame of mind for the race. And uh, Nicky's the guy who's been putting the one lap speed in. He's had two pole positions before. Um, so he's the ideal guy for this job in this incredible 296 Ferrari GT3 Switch to the Ferrari, and it's been a very good start to that relationship by the looks of things. Yeah, so we're carrying the Rinaldi cues, I noticed. So yes. the green skirts, the green trim on the, the bottom of the splitter there, but the, the full Fricadelli livery otherwise. Car 16 is uh, one of many Audis that have either pre-qualified pre into top Q2 or got in at the last minute, and the 16 car... Uh, is one of those, the share of sport car that was qualified by Swiss, Ricardo Feller, to actually the third and the fourth place cars to go from the long lineup are both cars to get through from qualifying one. The number two Mercedes for team Get Speed, and that's a, a lineup that involves Maxi Gertz and Adam Christodoulou. Do we find out a driver for Mercedes number two, Get Speed? Difficult to say. I mean, Krista Dulu is the, the the real expert around here, having done so much mileage. But you would put Maxi Gertz in as well, equally. Yeah, so. I, 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 some of the teams are uh, saying on social media and what have you, who's doing what qualifying duties. However, Getspeed were one that didn't. <laughs> so we're going to have to be patient for another 60 seconds, Johnny. Yeah, okay. um, but well, we've held on this long. Uh, I know. All week. I know. All year, actually. Because <laughs> this is one of those standout sessions. We're desperate that it will run its distance as well. The full green flag lap and then the two flying laps. And stick with this because of the nature of the fuel being full from start and mm. you know there is that, that massive opportunity I would say bigger than in previous years to improve greatly on the second time around as long as the tyres hold up to the challenge the 30 second board is now being displayed then to the number 39 Audi Quattro liveried at least R8 LMS uh, at, in its pr prime spot but it's going to be testing the water if you like uh, the bellwether car 
out front with tucked in behind Nicky Katzberg's Fricadelli livery, brand new Ferrari 296. Green flag is waved and the 39 car is away. Nicky Katzberg has mentioned in the Ferrari they will launch their way straight onto the Nordschleife. This serves not only as a way of warming the car up, both brakes and tyres, but also a chance for a sighter lap as well. It is Maximilian Gertz in the half red, half black, number two team get speed Mercedes Peter Mackay yeah and in the number 39 Audi Sport team land car that's the uh, Quattro Group B rally car throwback livery that's Christopher Meese former winner of this race Marcus Winklehawk in the uh, Scherer uh, Audi which is uh, car number uh, car number five um, of that one and then three Maro Engel a triple pole setter here Augusto Farfus in, in the 99. It's like reading out the GT Driver Hall of Fame here, Pretty isn't much. it? Oh, oh. Yeah. So fair. No, there, there are no weak links in this at all as we now get to Kelvin van der Linde in the number 27 Fujitsu sponsored, uh, so pretty much all black Lamborghini with the mini dorsal fin on the rear. The two Falcon Motorsport Porsches have found one another in the lineup, 33 ahead of 44, so they're in numerical order as well. Nico Menzel in the 44, he's already had a tyre issue earlier in the day. I missed he was in the 33. Backler or Picariello? It was due to be Picariello, but it's uh, Klaus Backler's being shown on the driver ID. Okay. Arjun Maini for the number 16 Bilstein Mercedes crew. And it's going to be Macho Giamini for line speed by car collection, car number 24 Porsche. Now, interestingly, car collection do have an Audi in the field as well, and they've had to have two completely segregated crews so that there is no data transfer between those two. So uh, a, a, a wall between there at uh, car collection. By the way, it is Walter Honung, our race director, who is the man with the green flag. So oh, he's, he's not in race control. He's still got his anorak yeah. and, and popped out to get these, and he did the honours in the first one as well. And I would assume it's Valter as well, scheduled to wave the chequered flag on uh, Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And, uh, much discussion, I remember, 12 months ago between John Hindhoff, me, various people on the collective as well, about exactly when that chequered flag was going to come out, because yeah. last year it waited for the race did. leader to come around, which isn't the tradition here in the 24 hours. It normally comes out right on the 24-hour marker, but a change of rule there, which I think they've adopted again for 2023. Just a quick note, at uh, Flans Garden, where uh, Jochen, the famous Jochen uh, from Frozen Speed, photographer extraordinaire, one day I'll get him to photograph my car, uh, frozenspeed.com. He says it's much darker yeah. at Flans Garden. Uh, honestly, I, I wasn't t uh, telling porkies. I mean, I, I know I like to bring drama again. to events. I mean, does it again? <laughs> but this was based on, you know, actual research that I've done. Don't, uh, don't worry, I've just had a phone call from somebody saying there's a tornado. There's definitely not a tornado. No. Mm, we can rule that out, probably. Um, so it depends if anything does strike from the skies, where's it going to hit first? T typically over at Arenberg, Schweden, Kreutz, and, and work its way back towards Flugplatz. But, but, but let's hope. I mean, I, w I wouldn't like a weather-affected qualifying session. We're going to try and keep it as even as possible across the two flying laps. This definitely uh, goes for the argument for the banker lap, anyway, that's for sure, yes. to get that lap in. And if you're... There's a little bit of kind of give and take here because the road is still pretty dirty at Hats and Back. So you really, if for that reason, you want to be further down the order for that road to clean up a bit more. However, if the weather does happen to roll in like it can do here in the Eiffel region, um, then uh, you want to be as far up the order as possible and get your banker in before that weather comes in. So. It's really interesting, but given how much warm weather we've had all week, the track temperature this afternoon was up to 38 degrees Celsius, mm. nearly double what it was in the qualifying race. And it has to be said, we've got a, quite a change here now, slightly cooler track conditions as Nicky Katzberg, car number 30, Ferrari for Fricadelli on his warm-up lap. Has he gone past Chris Mace? On the, on he was two seconds faster than Mace through uh, the second portion of the Grand Prix track. I don't think he's going quite fast enough to have done that, though. There are cars already bunching up. Oh. So, for instance, the 27 Lamborghini, or Van der Linde, is closing in on Augusto Farfus in the number 99 BMW, the Rover racing car. So there's some 
changing of the order, you sense. And, and indeed, down into Arenberg, oh, I thought about it. That is the, the Huber Racing car tucked in behind the number six. So that was Mathieu Jaminet. And now a bit of give and take, drawing alongside uh, Arjun Miney. Miney might just be wise to keep to allow Jaminet through, so desperate as he is for track position, John. In the Fox Hall, side <laughs> by side, on the warm-up lap. Really? Yeah, it's yeah. a tad unnecessary. Well, if there's weather coming in, you, if, we, if we've heard about it, you can be sure the teams know about it, if it is there. And they'll be on the radio saying, get a move on, go for it, F a flat out. Um, because we need, if the rain comes in, you do not want to be caught out. Because there's, yes, we, we've set, the, this is for the pole position shootout. If this qualifying session, top qualifying two session goes badly, you're, you're at the wrong end of the top 20. So this is high, high stakes here for this race. So this is for positions 1 to 19. Correct. We know that in 20th position will be Grello. Yep. That is sorted. We've set every other position bar the top 19. And Chris Meese is still ahead uh, of Nicky Katzberg. I just uh, saw the two split times lighting up. Well, this is it, really. You've got one where your tyres are at the best, possibly a banker after that. And they're only just coming... Uh, do you know I'm not I'm not sure again no, that was the Ferrari going into the carousel right. as the Audi was leaving it and uh, right. Ferrari's got okay. big number 30 slapped on the on top the NASCAR style yeah. and that was the 296 of Nicky Katzberg Chris Meese is not hanging around it does visually look like Katzberg is uh, upping the pace yet further but um, well the proof is going to be in the first push lap proper which is going to be not too far away now. They're in the very long seventh sector of the lap, which at full race speed takes you about two minutes and 27 seconds. So it's a fair old wait now before they pop into sector eight, which includes the Kleiner carousel down the hill towards Brunchen. Campsite hugely populated there, as typically it is for this weekend. Now, is there has there been a problem for the number three of... Maro Engel because Engel seems to have dropped back behind a few other cars. It might be again that Farfus and Sheldon Van and uh, Van der Linde um, have got through in the 99 and 27 BMW and Lamborghinis respectively, but it does look like Engel's at least a sector behind. At least, yeah. So perhaps Maro Engel noticing that there was a lot of cars in that bunch, four or five cars in a bunch, and he uh, Maro Engel's very clever. He probably looked around and thought, OK, right, on you guys, go on then if you want, and I'll, I'll do my building later in the lap. That's the luxury you have here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife, you know, a 25-kilometre lap combined with the Grand Prix circuit, of course. Uh, you do have that little bit of, uh, of flexibility as well. And uh, Nicky Katzberg just winding up. It's closed the gap in ever so slightly to Christopher Mees, but uh, not enough for it to, to disturb either driver. This is a huge... Alexander Sims nailed it by saying the word privilege. It is a privilege to have an SP9 car, brand new tyres. Uh, OK, it's on a full tank of fuel, but come on. Um, you've got the whole place to yourself. Go as fast as you possibly can. Um, this is to win the the Glickenhaus Pool Award. This is this is a big 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 stakes here. The road order now appears to be Chris Meese, 39 yes. Audi, ahead of Maxi Gertz in the black and red Get Speed Mercedes. They've hit the Dottinger first, so Nicky Katzberg somewhat absent without leave at this stage. May just be that he's dropped back a little bit again to allow himself some track position. So far from getting ahead of the Audi in front of it, it's uh, eased back a touch. We're also waiting for. Oh, there goes Katzberg to head on to the Dottinger Hoare now as the third placed car in the sequence. But back onto the main straight. Top qualifying two is now officially underway. And the power from the Audi out of Hohenrein and over the line towards the start finish straight as the clock begins to tick down for Christopher Meese. Maximilian Gertz, who was third in the queue on the start finish line at the start of this lap, now running as the second car on the road. Nicky Katzberg's got plenty of real estate ahead of him and the Fricadelli Racing Avalan sponsored Ferrari 296. Headlights piercing through a little bit of gloom that we have here at the Nürburgring on the Grand Prix Strecker. Fully dry, though, left to right for Christopher Meese, wanting to hit those brakes as late as possible down at the Dunlop Kerver. 
of the Goodyear curve, I should say, with the Goodyear, the Goodyear uh, sc scoring tower for 2023. I was in the gravel there, Peter, but I think I just about say. Yeah, that. you did. Right. Well done, Johnny. Yeah, Maxi Goetz goes three tenths of a second quicker in the opening sector on Christopher Mee. So great first sector there for Maxi Goetz in the number two Get Speed Mercedes. That's the red and black Get Speed Mercedes. The green and black one is the green hell car, the number three machine. Nikki Katzberg. Ooh, also three tenths off the pace of Goetz in that, that opening sector. That opening sector is effectively the first half of the Grand Prix circuit down towards the Goodyear curve. Hairpin. Yeah, and now heading through the, the tricky section on the Grand Prix track, which is the wide left followed by the wide right. This year, named the, the Bilstein curve, Advan Bogen, that flat-out kink that then leads into the faster version of the chicane that we always utilise for the 24-hour race. And one, two gain a position in the second part of qualifying the 16 Audi driven by Winkelhock and uh, it's Marcus then in that number 16 car for share of sport just breaking the bean now at the end of the second portion of the Grand Prix track plenty of curb there from the share of sport blue and white Audi turning left at Sabina Schmidt's curve and onto the hats and back for the first time well any time that Katzberg dropped to Maxi Gutz in sector one, well, he gained it right back again in sector two. That's effectively the end of the Grand Prix track, as well as the number, the uh, one of the Scherer Sport PHX Audis heading down towards the hats and back for the first time. That's Marcus Winkelhock, and it, yeah, the, the hats and back mm, a tidy, um, a little bit tidier than it was uh, in the top qualifying one, but it is still there. So the drivers who are further down the order are going to have a little advantage in that area, I think, Johnny. Yeah, pl still plenty of curve, though, from Winkelhock, and it's, 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 you've got to be so careful which ones you whack there, because I thought that Kevin Esther in the first run of this caught too much on the left side. That put him well off the line then over the block paving curve, where we later had the accident for... Christian Krognes in the 102 numbered BMW M4 from Valkenhorst. Adding our force now for the leading car, Christopher Meese. Neat and tidy through there. Plenty of curb on the exit then, and the car drops down from what is a high bricked curve. Uh, and then the burst of throttle heading towards the double left hander at Metzgersfeld next. Now, Nicky Katzberg now really getting into the rhythm now. He's had three. Uh, purple sectors in a row here at the wheel of the Frickadelli Ferrari number 30. Not such a, a hot lap yet for, for Christopher Mees in the number 39 uh, Audi with the yellow, red, grey and black and white colours of the uh, Group B rally car of Audi Sport. It's the 40th anniversary of Audi Sport this year and there's one of their celebration liveries uh, as well great opening sector from triple pole setter maro engel so maro engel did drop back yeah. went dropped a couple of positions back but no such problem with his opening sector he's going faster than anybody by a good old margin well, there it, johnny in sector one wow that is the only car to drop into the 39s yeah. on the first half of the grand prix track and everybody else ahead of him done a 44 so I think 40.4, 40.2, but a 39.9 from Mauro Engel in the number three get speed Mercedes. That car really starting to turn up the wick. What's the second sector like on the Grand Prix Strecker? 42.4, 42.2 is the best through there so far from Katzberg in the Ferrari. Fascinating, as it so, it so often is, where the different cars, the different shapes and sizes, engine position, and weights as well, where they're finding their advantage. And no doubt about it, the Mercedes, particularly in the hands of Munich man Maro Engel, very strong in that first part of the Grand Prix lap. Usually so. Well, we talked about the disappointment for Porsche with the Manti racing car not making it through to this top qualifying two session. Well, Nico Menzel is trying to put that right. He's gone faster than anyone in sector three of the circuit in his Falcon tired Porsche. The two Falcon cars have struggled for out like outright pace in the earlier sessions, but this is when it really matters. And Nico Menzel is stepping up to the plate. But for the round, the circuit. Circuit. It's still Nicky Katzberg who's lighting up the timing screens. And I think, Johnny, if he, if he continues at this rate, he will be putting that first benchmark on the board. 
Engel's gone a, at least a second quicker than the car ahead of him, which is the Marcus Winkelhock driven Audi, although Maxi Gertz there or thereabouts in the sister get speed Mercedes. How do they compare to Katzberg's time for the first segment of the Nordschleife proper? There's only about two tenths in it, really. So they're, again, very equal indeed in such different cars. Plenty of kerb taken by the 296 Ferrari now as we heading for the latter portion of the lap. This is the long Sector 7 then, which includes Brunchen. Sections like Ice Curva as well. Brunchen now, in fact, for Chris Meese in the number 39 car, heading underneath the trees. Flat Scott next, which is where we've been having reports of the sky getting a little darker immediately ahead, uh, above head. Looks pretty ideal at the moment for the drivers as Christopher Mees gets all four wheels off, going over Flansgarten, full commitment, and then, oh, run it using all the roads and more, coming across to the Stefan Beloff S, full commitment. Well, Mr. Beloff would have loved that, that's for sure. Lost time, though, I think. Oh, yeah, a couple of yeah. You know, inches of tyre on the grass there, which it looked like it was, maybe just the ripple strip then I think the 39 car has been compromised. He's way up the kerb again, approaching the Schwabenschwanz, the second concreted area. And the 39 car, although it's out front at the moment in road position, is rather being chewed up by the Ferrari in its wake. Katzberg, a couple of cars back in the red and white Fricadelli Ferrari because it's purple now in six sectors. It's gone purple in four of them. Katzberg is really a light. Oh, this is, it's been the real one of the main talking points, not just of this Nürburgring 24 hour week, it's been the whole Nürburgring season has led up to this. Frickadelli, a short move from Porsche to Ferrari to a rival manufacturer, and they are just loving this new car. And Nick, Nicky Katzberg is pulling so much pace out of it here as well. Frickadelli have been very relaxed through the early sessions this week, but on this one lap dash, really remarkable stuff. Christopher Mee is coming up to the tier garden, so we should have our first benchmark time on the board very shortly. 225.2 for the Ferrari in the hands of Mickey Katzberg, going even faster than that, though, Marcus Winkelhock. So that tells me that's where the Audi's finding all of its time. First Audi to cross the line will be at 813.910 to set the benchmark, but you can be assured there are some much faster cars about to come through. Mies onto his second lap, second and final lap, that is, for Audi 39, but already 1.5 seconds faster is Maximilian Goethe. Katzberg goes nearly two seconds faster than that, an 8.10.518 for the Fricadelli Racing Ferrari 296. There's more pace, though. There's more pace for sure. The, remember, in top qualifying one, Ricardo Feller did an 8.10 flat, so there is more pace in this racetrack, no doubt about it, as well as Marcus Winkelhock comes over the line. He goes third quickest with an 8.12.421. Chris Meese will be very disappointed yeah. in that lap. He's a second and a half away from a similar car, the 16 Sherris Bork machine. So, but there is another chance uh, for him. He won't have as much tyre to lean upon, but the car will be in a better state as the fuel continues to burn off. This is good practice as well for the race at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon as to how the car's going to behave when you're looking to wriggle free on a clear racetrack on full tanks. Rover Racing BMW, Augusto Farfus coming down Dottinger now. Antonius Bucher, that very fast left-hander underneath the bridge, is what he's targeting. The apex four as the car just moves very slightly from as we look at it, the left-hand side, his driver's right to the middle of the road and to vaguely the apex. It says, how late do you break there? Staring at the end of the Arnco barrier, which is painted in orange because that's also a martial post. Threading his way through Hohenheim over the little lip, which brings you back onto the Grand Prix track. And what's the Brazilian going to set this time? Augusto Farfas will go second fastest with an 811.921. 1.4 seconds slower, though, than Katzberg's time in the Ferrari. But that gives us more of an idea, idea Peter, of where perhaps the BMWs are. I tell you what, top qualifying one was a very tough school compared to these first times that we're seeing, which, of course, top qualifying one, as it turned out, was a one-lap shootout, effectively. Yeah. We had two 810s and two 811s. So, you know, the pace in top qualifying one was really, really hot. So let's see if anyone can get underneath that pace as well. Here comes Arjun Miney. He's been one of the top drivers.
drivers of the week. He goes third quickest, 811.3 for the Indian. And the one we've missed is Nico Menzel going fourth oh. in the 44 Falcon Motorsport Porsche to split those two. He's got the time down to 0.693 of a second then to Katzberg. That's much more competitive than uh, it was standing at nearly a second and a half. Mathieu Jaminet goes fifth in the Porsche, make that sixth with an 812.2 as the uh, Frank Stippler in the Audi goes second, 811 flat. Stippler on a charge, maybe even more to give. We're waiting for Maro Engel, as you quite rightly point out. Maro Engel to oh. the top. It's an 809.4, oh. which is a second clear of Katzberg's really impressive time in the Ferrari. Oh. So AMG to the top of the charts from Ferrari, Audi, Porsche. The mixture is well and truly there. Well, let's see what Indy Doncic can do in that the Valkenspiegel team Monschau Ferrari, the number 20 car run by Rinaldi Racing, the same outfit that are helping with the Fricadelli car. He sets some, sets some very good sector times. He's coming up to the line now. It's his big, big cugs in the Get Speed Performance garage as well. They're delighted with that lap time. That puts them on provisional pole. Indy Doncic just dropped off in the latter part of the lap there, 18, 15, 15th quickest as Fred from Fisch comes up to the line. Fred Vervich, a winner last year, will go sixth in the number one car, 811.6 to slot in then between Argent Miney's effort in the number six Mercedes and the 99 uh, BMW of Augusto Farfa. Speaking of BMWs, Stan Harper goes 13th in the number 72 junior team BMW. Oh, oh and to the top, to, yeah, Marciello. New record. Raffaele Marciello, even faster than that, 0.4 of a second quicker than Mauro Engel. So we talked about a strong lap for Mercedes AMG. That's an even better one from the rapid Italian. Well, that is a new Nürburgring qualifying lap record for Raffaele Marciello. It's sat for five years since 2018. Lawrence Vantor for Team Mantine for Porsche. That lap record has been broken by Raffaele Marciello and Team Get Speed. Mercedes. Well, we said that the paint on that car made it heavier. It must make it quicker. <laughs> wow, what a what a performance in qualifying there from Rafael Marciello. But we're still well into the second laps now, Johnny. Yeah. Can anybody improve? I see a lot of personal best sectors, but is it going to be enough to change that order at the top of the field? So far, crucially, perhaps no purples, unless you count Kelvin van der Linde in the 27 Lamborghini. Actually, he's just gone quicker in sector three, which is the run through. Hats and back. Ho and Ryan uh, to Ho Hiking, I should say, and on towards Flugplatz and Schwedenkreuz beyond. So, still clearly the Lamborghini finding some speed, but I just wonder whether the tyre performance drop off is going to be greater now than the advantage you're getting from less fuel being on board. Maybe Mercedes knew about that. It's uh, the team Bilstein car then of Raffaele Marciello, the Swiss born Italian racer, although running on a Swiss flag for this meeting from the very German Mara Engel in the get speed Mercedes car number three. So four quicker than three by uh, 0.4 of a second and then six tenths of a second on from that is Nicky Katzberg in the number 30 Ferrari looking at a second row start at the, this time for the Dutchman Peter. Yeah, Nicky Katzberg not looking like he's going to improve. Um, he's had uh, he had a personal best early on in the lap on one of the sectors, but it's dropped off. So Katzberg, maybe that one lap dash was, was all he had, but still looking like it's going to be a strong grid position in that leading bunch for Fricadelli Ferrari. But Mercedes looking good, one and two at the moment with two of their real stalwart factory drivers there, Raffaele Marciello and Maro Engel. And of, uh, but also split across their two teams. It's uh, Team Bilstein uh, in the, the leading place, and then it's uh, Get Speed in second. Squealer tyres there coming through Flansgarten, or at least approaching it in a moment or two for the Christopher Meese driven Audi, and catching the ripple strip again on the run towards this flat out section. But I'm sure Meese is going to be much happier with his efforts this time mm. around. Six sectors complete so far on that two, and five of them have been improvements for car 39. 
Uh, Va Van, uh, Kelvin van der Linde in the seven, uh, 27 up Lamborghini is setting some very hot sectors, some very good personal bests, some all-time bests in sector three and sector five. So the Lamborghini at the moment for up sports line is in 13th. It could hop up the order as oh, Christopher Mees. Full commitment through Galkenkopf. Ah, what a spectacular driving style he has just ringing out every last bit of lap time that there is he's 3.4 down on that incredible new lap record for qualifying from Raffaele Marciello but it looks like Christopher Mies is going to vault himself up the order at this stage well we know the Audis are pretty good in in down the straights and in mm. clean air so uh, doing a 20.1 through the first bit of dotting a whore, but we have seen cars going faster than that, notably the Ferrari, car number 30, the Nicky Katzberg straddling the white line there as he headed from Tiergarten into Hohenrein the sunset is uh, really spectacular here in the uh, Nürburgring area as the, as the Audi for car 39 crosses the line, that is an improvement for Christopher Mies who will go up to 14th position and with an 813.001. Mercedes over the line as well, and... Maxi Goetz. Maxi Goetz did improve, 811.824, but still only in eighth position. What's the Ferrari going to do in the hands of Nicky Katzberg? Does not improve, an 815, in fact, 0.9, which is about five seconds down from his earlier effort. I think he backed off of that. Once he knew that it wasn't going to be an improvement, he backed right off, yeah. saved the uh, tyre allocation, get, get back off of it. Does Maro Engel have anything to say? It doesn't look like it on the splits at the moment. Marcus Winkelhock is pushing very, very quick. He's put in five personal best sectors, sits eighth at the moment, but nobody seems to be getting close to that time of Raffaele Marcello. With it's hard to tell, but the number 27 Lamborghini, though, might vault up the order as well uh, with Kelvin van der Linde at the wheel. He set a couple of purple all-best sectors there in that car also, but full oh, excitement here in this top qualifying too. We knew it would be. I, I think Kelvin van der Linde is, will, will be the one to improve and yeah. potentially break into the top 10, maybe even improve upon that, but it's uh, that's the big question mark now for me. There are green times here, there and everywhere. There's just not a lot of purple. Although, Raffaele Marciello has found even more speed in the number four, Team Bilstein Mercedes. That's in the 35-second sector at sector six. He's now plunging his way into the really long one uh, through Bruchin and uh, Flanscott. So we may know a little bit more at the end of that in about two and a half minutes' time. Are we going to see our first ever 8.08 qualifying time here on the Nordschleife? That would be quite incredible sight as the Rover BMW number 99 comes over 812.6 and here comes the 27 Lamborghini for App Sportsline and 810.4 and Kelvin van der Linde the only South African to ever win this race goes third third in behind the two Mercedes from those different outfits so at the moment we have an all Italian second row with a Lamborghini on one side of the grid and a Ferrari on the other and it is Kelvin van der Linde versus Nicky Katzberg in a sense. Katzberg already back, having completed his second lap, which we reckon he backed off during. Now, Mauro Engel is on the dotting of Hoor, looking for other improvements. We're waiting for Marciello in the number four car, which is the one that looks like it's been drawn, uh, like a sketching a GT3 car, rather than the number six car, the Pro-Am machine driven by Indian driver Arjun Maini. Katzberg has scooted into the pit lane via the back door uh, at the Grand Prix hairpin. Maro Engel, though, skating his way through Hohenrein and applying the throttle. He will cross the line on the main straight. And Maro Engel, who currently occupies the second fastest time, it's an 8.15 again. So there's evidence once more that he decided to back off too and hang on instead to the 809.480. Well done to Colin Karasani for Schnitzel Arm Racing and his first ever appearance in top qualifying tour at the Nürburgring 24 hour. He qualifies just behind the uh, just behind Christopher Mies' Audi and Dan Harper's BMW. So what does Inti Doncha have to say? He's setting personal best everywhere. Can he get further up the order? Can Raffaele Marciello improve on that incredible lap time for Paul here through Antonio Spuka? He goes.
He's gained a little bit of time here and there, but actually when you look at uh, his best sector, which was sector seven on his first effort, lost about two seconds, maybe one and a half seconds in comparison. So I'm not sure it's going to be an improvement. He doesn't actually need to improve right now because he holds on to the pole position time with no real threat. And across the line, it isn't as good. It's an 811.6 compared to the 809 flat that he set first time around. So still has a cushion and a relatively large cushion of 0.4 of a second back to the rest. And that for me was an awesome lap, rather sort of sneaking up uh, because he was one of the, the last cars to set off from the grid, but put the business in nice and early when the car, when the tyres were the most sticky. We were all concentrated on Marrow Engel, but the high fives can now fully commence down at Team Bilstein. And most of the best laps being set on the first run. Yes. Most for most cars. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, and Raffaele Marciello, as you mentioned, Johnny, a little bit further back down the order, that little bit of cleaning effect at Hudson Back had to make some a little bit of difference, but it's a 25-kilometer lap, and Raffaele Marciello absolutely nailed it. He's never won this race before. He's just put himself in the position to the best possible position to go for that win when we, when we kick off tomorrow. So it's two Mercedes from a Lamborghini, from a Ferrari, from an Audi, and then the first of the Porsches, what a bounce back for the number 44 Falcon crew. They had a, um, they had a problem with a tyre failure uh, earlier on or tyre damage earlier on in practice and qualifying, and there they qualify six, the top Porsche with an 811.2. Actually, nine of the 19 cars were able to improve with their second laps, which surprises ah, me. I didn't think so it was going to be... about half and half, then. 50-50 mm. split. The biggest one to benefit was Kelvin van der Linde, yeah, without yeah. doubt. I thought he might break into the top ten. He eventually went third with the apt Sportsline Lamborghini Huracan. But that does leave us with a Lambo and a Ferrari on the second row, in behind the two big AMG Benzes. And then we've got the Frank Stippler Shera Sport Audi R8, the first of the R8s in the order to qualify in fifth position with an 812.3, uh, an 811.0. In fact, he set that on the first of two laps from the best positioned Porsche. And I think Falcon Motorsports will be very, very happy with that, considering the, the magnitude of teams that they have managed to outpace in two lap qualifying. Nico Menzel, every credit to him coming back from the disappointment of the earlier session, left stranded out in the country with a, a rear left tyre having gone down, car 44 qualifying in sixth place. Yeah, absolutely, Johnny, absolutely. It's, uh, whew, I mean, two 809s, we, we thought that the, the Q1, the top Q1 drivers might have shown up the top Q2, but no, when it comes down to it, it's always that last, that ultimate 101% push and who better to do that than, than Raffaele Marciello? I mean that, that team have had some they've had some difficulties. Phil Ellis has been a bit under the under the weather this week. Uh, Eduardo Mortara in the team as well to uh, just in case Phil isn't able to to drive. Mercedes have only won this race twice. You know, Audi have won it six times, Porsche uh, many more times than that. Porsche uh, they won it uh, 13 times from my memory and then BMW with 20 victories so um, a great place for Mercedes to add to that tally big smiles in the Frickadelli garage I think they're pretty happy with that to get on qualifier on the second row ideal right there in the fight Totally, yeah. uh, and uh, there is a, a little question mark, I suppose, about well, both the Porsche and the Ferrari in terms of how it's going to go re reliability-wise because it's a brand-new car for this season, and deliberately, the Nürburgring Nordschleife was built as a car tester, yeah, but a bit of a car breaker as well, so they've got to not necessarily sustain that level of pace for 24 hours, but they've got to stay out of the pits for as long as possible, and arguably it's more tricky with a car that is brand new to the team. But at least Rinaldi and those associated with that crew know their Ferraris just previously, the 488, of course. But we know that's made a huge leap uh, forward in terms of uh, general and absolute lap speed. And they just need to be able to sustain that now over, what, 28, 29, 30-odd stints mm. to get to the finish. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing I would not have predicted coming into this weekend is BMW qualifying no higher than 11th. Um, mm. That's a surprise because they've won the opening three rounds of the Nürburgring Langstrecken series. And yeah, have been at great pace in that championship, of course. So 
Augusto Farfus continues his uh, uh, little personal record of never being out qualified in the BMW at this track. Uh, so that record stays. Um, so yeah, 11th for the BMW of uh, Farfus of Rover Racing. Then it's the BMW Junior Team in 17th and then Volkenhorst in 19th. That's not what BMW came here for. There's perhaps a lesson here about where teams have been going wrong all over the years. Uh, build, your, build your car out of um, comic book paper because mm. it's lighter and a heck of a lot and, lighter. And paint it. And paint it, uh, yeah. Well, use paint, which is actually quite a bit heavier than uh, standard wrap, but uh, that is a real car beneath the cartoon uh, outlay and Raffaele Marciello wasting no time whatsoever in charging through to that set that 809.058 to take a first pole position at this event from fellow Mercedes, this time from Team Get Speed, Maro Engel. It is a Lamborghini outpacing a Ferrari on the second row. Audi and Porsche will occupy the third row and then a combination of Mercedes and Audi come next with Arjun Maini and Fred Verwisch from his victory last year coming back. It's quite a mixture of cars. That's always what we like to see in GT3 racing. Well, John. Well, Johnny, it's been a very exciting day of action. Lots of question marks. Uh, a few questions answered there in that qualifying session. Mercedes really coming to the fore. They did, and surprised many of us, I'm sure, because it's about, I don't know, working your way through the sessions that matter. Car setup needs to be ticked off both in the qualifying weekend and then into night practice. But they had to then really turn on the style and the speed of the car during that tricky lead into Q2 really because we must remember it was delayed for the second batch of cars as well when do you then begin all of your preparation considering we ran about 30 minutes behind in the end but it didn't affect Mauro Engel it certainly didn't affect Swiss man Raffaele Marciello in the team Bilstein the cartoon liveried uh, Mercedes and it's AMG on the front row for tomorrow's race.
Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome along. It's the traditional Friday evening entertainment, delayed a little bit by the overrunning of the shootout qualifying for the ADAC Total Energy's 24 hours of the Nürburgring. It's John and Becky back together again. I want to say the dream team, but one of us is a bit of a nightmare, and it's not Becky. So welcome back to our global broadcast centre, uh, Becky. Good to have you company. Are you all done up in your fi finery? Uh, uh, what, what's been going on before before this this evening for you? Absolutely, I'm delighted to be back. It's uh, it's a real honour every year. You know, it's one of my favourite events of the most sport calendar. But yeah, I've just been hosting uh, a gala dinner for Falcon Tires, so I am dressed up i've just sprinted here if it's possible to sprint in high heels it's sort of a it's more of a trot shall we say uh to run up to the commentary box so i can join you to see what's going on at the modern black Schiffer. now this has become as i say a bit of a tradition the falcon drift show and uh, you and i were sitting here a year ago i i would say we've got more cars this year i think we definitely have i mean i it looks like a bigger field for sure and i've had a little look down the entry list and there's a, a few new names in here and some old ones and some great uh some great falcon drivers out there so i'm excited to see what they can do you can see the teams just coming down onto the track here now just doing a little victory lap shall we say yeah a bit of pre-warming of those uh, rear tires uh, before we get into this, we should make the point that this is a demonstration, this is not a competition, but we'll try and talk you through the nuances of uh, drift competition so that you understand what would be happening if this was being scored yes. and if this was, in fact, a big shiny trophy up for grabs. Drifting's been around quite a while now, started as a very much an underground sport in Japan. Absolutely. I mean, drifting has exploded in popularity over the years. I mean, starting on the Togo roads in Japan, uh, it's then sort of traversed its way around the world. I mean, being made extremely famous by that film that we all know, The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. But it's come such a long way as a sport. Uh, I mean, it's precision driving at its best. And right now, drifting is having a huge, huge moment globally. I mean, we're seeing unprecedented attendance Why? events. Why? I just think it's one of those sports which is, it's loud, it's proud, it's smelly, it's here, it's having fun, it's you know? It's the best of motorsport. We like loud, smelly, loud, proud and smelly. <laughs> That's part of the, it, it, it is, it's an assault to all your senses, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a visceral experience because these cars, I mean, you can see the lineup in front of you. Most of them have got an engine swap of some sorts in it. Uh, you know, a lot of engines being favoured with uh, V8s and 2JZs. So, you know, super loud. Super aggressive. I mean, the first car on the track that we see here is James Dean and his Eurofighter 2JZ powered. Now, here's a man who's uh, completely not afraid of throwing a car around a corner. I think he's got 18 championships under his belt, including, you know, three-time American champion, five-time European champion, three-time uh, Middle Eastern champion. He is in his uh, happy zone right now, shall we say. So, we recognise that as a BMW. Yes. But... This is an engine swap, so when you say the, the, the what was it, the three JZ you said? Two JZ. Two JZ. So, so where's that come from? So then? that's come out of a Mark IV Toyota. Now this is why this six cylinder uh, three litre engine is extremely popular in drifting because you can get huge power out of them uh, with not too little difficulty. I mean, James is running around 900 horsepower in his E92 just there. Okay. Yes. This was my favorite car last year. Oh, and it oh. goes for a spin <laughs> uh, immediately. This is a looks like a five series. Yeah, a it BMW. is. E and e has this still got a Beamer engine, or has this been uh, swapped over for Mark I'm, in this car? I'm pretty sure he's got a V8 in there because uh, Rohan is a he's a very popular driver in the Falcon team there. But in the E39 M5 that you see on the track, he's great fun. I mean, obviously, I think he went for a bit of a 360 there, didn't quite make it. And here we have is one of our English drivers. This is Steve Biagioni, uh, Monster Energy driver. In his PS13, you will have seen him last year. He was in his R35 GTR, which has an LSX engine in it. This PS13 also has an LS, I think it's a three. Um, but he uses this car for competition. He's very comfortable in it. He's just out there having some fun. LS3, it's General Motors V8. It would have done service originally in uh, Chevy Corvettes and mm. various bits and pieces very very popular crate engine for all kinds of uh, applications whether it's hot rods or stock cars or indeed here they are nigh on indestructible so high revs 
uh, high stress situations, mm -hmm. that's why it's in that car. Absolutely. I mean, with drifting, you want high power so you can keep those rear wheels spinning at all times. Plenty of torque. I mean, you know the differences between a 2JZ, which is a turbo car, as opposed to the naturally aspirated V8. It's very much a divider. Are you a V8 person or are you a turbo 2JZ, you know? And uh, everybody picks their poison. You know, uh, Bagsy's always been very much a V8 guy. James is very much a 2JZ. OK, uh, a very Mondrian-esque BMW here. Yes. Uh, that was an E92 yes. uh, that was going round. And contrast that with a plain white, a 315 uh, BMW that's out there at the moment. Aside from engine swaps, Becky, what else are typical modifications on these cars? Obviously, the, the cooling systems are working harder uh, because the engines are, are revving all the time. But what else is going on engineering-wise in these cars to be able to get them to go at these ridiculous angles? Well, the thing, the main thing with angle is you need uh, the extended knuckles on the front. You need more steering lock, because as you can see, some of these cars are hitting almost 90 degrees as he's bungeeing down the straight here. So you want that extra um, steering lock just enabled so you can throw the rear end of the car around and be able to control it. I mean, your normal car, you've probably got maximum two turns of lock, right? These can have three and a half, right. nearly four. On a very quick rack On a well, very quick rack So as that well. you can move it quickly. Uh, hydraulic handbrakes on some of these as well, to be a, or, or e-brakes or parking brakes, as, as the Americans would call them. Every single one of these cars that you see out there will have a hydraulic handbrake, and it, that is the key to disengaging the rear wheels um, and initiating the car into a slide, as you see this lovely E30 here. It's just oh, powering out of that slide. Uh, and there will be what's called a fly-off handbrake, so un unlike um, most cars nowadays have electronic handbrakes, let's be uh, absolutely clear on that, but if you're old enough like me to remember a uh, handbrake that goes tick, 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 yeah, click out. Uh, and then you've got to push the button, pull it up and drop it again. No, no, there's none of that. There's a big lever here. You give a big yank on that. The hydraulic system, like your foot operated brake pedal, locks up the back wheels and disengages the drive, and then you just immediately leave go of it once you've got that slide going, the skill then is balancing steering input and throttle input. Effectively, Becky, you're driving the car with your right foot here. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have six inputs, right? You have left foot brake. Well, I'll start with the, with the first one. You have your hydraulic handbrake. You have your steering input. You have your throttle input. You have your left foot brake input. Wow. Yeah, I know there's so much going on. You also have your gears. You can use engine braking as, as well. And also, um, I said steering input. But you're using all of these things to, uh, to your arsenal when you're out there. And it's just a, a lot of it is timing. When you at first initiate the car, you can see here this GT86 is sort of swinging the back end around. He's timing his throttle inputs to make sure you're keeping that car gliding across the track. So, for those of us who grew up doing rallying, which I did up in the northeast of England, the Scandinavian flick was the thing that you used on a rally car, particularly on dirt. Yes. Which uh, unsettles the car. Now, circuit racing, you want to keep the car as settled as possible. Here, you're kind of unsettling the car like a rally driver. So, bizarrely, you're going down into the hairpin there at the bottom of the track. It's a right turn, but we're seeing people turning left, first of all. Yes, obviously, they're going to trying to put into opposite luck. You see the car on the track right now. This is one of the uh, Red Bull Drift Brothers. These are brand new G82 M4 uh, chassis. I mean, so you, you know the newest of the new uh, M4 uh, shape. These were actually prototype cars uh, that were given to the lads, and they have used actually the stock internal engine to create this monster that you see in front of you. So that is that is a BMW M4 with a BMW M4 engine? Correct, oh, that's correct. that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's the S58 engine. Um, I actually have one of these myself. I have a G80 M3, so I know how fast these cars are stock, but they've taken these cars and they've developed them uh, into the drift machine that you see in front of you now. I mean, if you check out the exhaust, the exhaust actually exit up and out the back ah. of the rear window there. Oh, here's James again. Full lock, full send. And full speed as full well. Speech, yeah. Locking up the inside front wheel there. That's yes. a little bit of left foot braking Correct. just trying to tuck that, that car in. Do you have a brake balance on these cars to try and dial more brake either to the front or to the back? That's kind of all down to your own foot pressure. I mean, uh, they use left foot braking as a way of balancing the car, as you just said. So when you're coming into uh, that, that bottom hairpin there, you'll, you'll pick your line, you'll get it nicely gliding on your throttle limper, and then you'll just touch over with your left toe just to keep the car a little bit ba like balanced. Now, all of the Falcon 
drift team that yes. are on that now are on Faultman tyres. Yes. Faultman are a big supplier of, of tyres. I do love the drift taxi. Yeah, that's which, actually Mark Visser, sorry. Yeah, Mark, yeah. yeah I apologise. I said Rohan earlier, but it is actually Mark Visser. The tyres are the tyres that are uh, supplied by the various tyre manufacturers, including Faultman. Are they standard tyres or is there something special for, to, to be able to produce uh, and, and live with the kind of torture that they're getting? <laughs> no, they're, they're literally just the, the standard of they Venus. Are they are. Not. I promise you they are. They are. They have been uh, mercilessly tested by these lads <laughs> out on the tracks. I will tell you that. James has been with uh, the Falcon team now for, I think it's 10 years. So he's seen the different iterations of the tyres, but the, I think it's the FK520, the Azenus, that he uses now. So that's uh, a straight, a road going tyre that, you, that comes in all different fitments for different cars. Yes. How I mean, long do they last then? So they're going to go through a set of tyres in this display tonight. I imagine so they'll go through a few sets, absolutely. Right. Because, uh, I mean, obviously it's quite high-speed corner. They're putting a lot of heat uh, through those tyres. And I'd say, you know, if let's look at a drift competition, for example. Uh, if you were doing a battle, let's say, yeah. but we'll get into it in, yeah. in a little bit. Uh, a set of tyres will do you two runs. And that's it? And that's it. Wow. Yeah. So, so having having a, a, a tyre sponsor, having backing from someone like Falcon is pretty much essential if you're going to compete at the, at the highest level. Otherwise, it's going to get very expensive very quickly. Absolutely. I mean, they are... Oh, it's the word perishables? It's not perishables, is it? It's, they're just Consumable. consumables. That's the word I was looking for. Apologies. Uh, they are consumables. They are the thing that you need the most, and yet uh, they can be quite expensive, especially if, you know, you, you could use, if you're doing practice, battles, across the weekend, you could use 40 sets of tyres. In, in racing and yes. in performance cars, yes. we're looking to try and get as much rubber on the ground as possible. Yes. So my car's got 20, 21s on the front and 22s on the back, and they're about this wide, which I know doesn't work on radio, that, um, and they're very low-profile tyres. Mm. They, obviously, because of that, you run them at quite high pressures. Yes. Anything special going on here in terms of pressures, widths of tyres? Because they don't look that wide to me. I think quite a few of these guys will be running a 265. I know James runs a 285 on the back of his E92. Um, but what I will say to you is to get maximum grip, sometimes these guys are running pressures as low as 7 PSI. Wow. Maximum contact patch onto yep. the track. And yeah, running extremely low pressure to the point where the tire is oh, effectively, it looks flat. Right. But it's because obviously when, uh, you know, they're putting so much pressure through it, they're putting the power down, as you see here, the tire actually increases the contact patch on the ground. It gives you that grip that you do really need. I think it's a common misconception yes. that people say, was that where you were going? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, because not normally, if you go to a race school, uh, and they want to make it difficult for you, they'll overpressure the tyres. Yes. So, so the back end of the car gets really Light. flighty. Uh, what you're saying here is you're starting them low, but of course what you're doing is you're superheating them. So that actually makes the air inside the, the, the tyres expand. Correct. It's very important in motor racing to get the right starting pressure mm -hmm. so that when you are doing your laps in the car, yep. the, the, the tyres in its operating temperature. Here, you're starting them low, they'll come up a little bit yes. to give you the right sort of balance. Now, we're starting to oh, do doing a what looks like now. a little uh, twin run. and uh, I think that's Rick Van Gotham that is with uh, James there. Now, this is more what we would see in a fully competitive uh, drift competition. Yes. It's normally uh, a drift battle would be held over three heats with uh, one driver leading out, then the other driver leading out. And, and, and what are we looking for then? If we were scoring this, what would we be looking for here, Becky? Oh, we're looking for proximity. We're looking for, basically, the chase car, which will be the car behind, is going to be following the lead car. And they're looking to mimic that driver's movements on track. I mean, obviously, during an actual drift competition, you're judged on your speed, your style, your line, and your angle. And you'll have a predetermined uh, track layout with clipping points. And that lead car is looking to put the best qualifying line down. And that chase car is following that lead car and is looking to mimic its actions completely. And then if you were trying to find the winner is who's got the best lead run and who's ha who's got the best chase. And to chase, you want to be really nice and close, mimicking that car's movements. As you see here with the E92 following the 46, he's just keeping a little bit of distance, but you can see his car is trying to maintain the same angle um, as, as him there.
Do, do you get people getting contact? I mean, it's it's not deliberate, clearly, but when you're running particularly at speed and you're trying to get cars close together, you, inevitably there must be contact. Sometimes. Oh, of course. I mean, a bit of rubbing, ain't you? Ain't rubbing, 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 rubbing's you ain't racing, racing, we say. Well, he's rubbing drifting as well, well sometimes. Well, I have to put it out there because, I, you know, it's a non-contact sport, right. as we all know. But, right. you know, if you're really aggressively chasing someone, they they call it banging doors, right? Right, OK. Yeah. Because you're getting so close to them that you can just give them a little nudge on their door just to let them know that you're there and you're... All, yeah, hi, 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 I'm here. Uh, you know, just... Uh, it's, a, it's an aggressive tactic, but it, it is something that you do see in drifting. At RSL underscore studio, if you want to get through to uh, Becky and myself in the Global Broadcast Centre... Uh, now, you said that uh, drifting has uh, exploded again. It went through a really uh, a, a really prominent patch. Uh, and what we're seeing now, I think more than ever before, is a, a really interesting variety of cars. It used to always be JTM, Jap Japanese to domestic market cars, but we're seeing more and more European cars like the BMWs. BMWs have always been pretty popular yep. even as a standard car because they have got good lock and mm -hmm. they've got quite long steering arms absolutely i mean one thing that you will see you will see a lot of uh jdm cars a lot of s chassis so nissan silvias i mean you can see the ps13 up there and uh, you know s14 s15 personally i have an s15 i mean that car is wonderful to drive it just floats around the track um, but what we are seeing, which is amazing, is manufacturer backing. I mean, you've got brand new G82 M4s from BMW. In, in Europe, we're seeing brand new Toyota A90 Supras. We're seeing brand new GR86s. Uh, in, in the States also, we have RTR Mustangs, a Ford Mustangs, the 2024 S650 chassis. So you know what? That gives me faith and hope that this is gonna, has, has the longevity. I mean, look at these two cars here. That is a big car as well. Can I just this point that car. out? Uh, these ads are controlling a big car. Well, they're actually bigger than the 5 Series taxi in terms of yes. their footprint now. Yes, they look uh, quite small on the track simply because, I mean, look, it's the Nürburgring. It makes yeah, everything look small, right? Um, but, yeah, they are a big car. But if you could do get a chance to ever have a look at these in the pits, I'd highly recommend you take Where, a Where's the paddock here this weekend? The paddock is down, I'm going to say, down that way. Nobody can see where I'm yeah, pointing. Okay, right I, now. I knew where you were going. Because <laughs> yeah. they used to be in the, in the old classic pits, uh, just be, be on the side of the, of the, the Doran, but Do you, you know moved what? down at the other end. I'm being you? silly. Do you know where it is? It's right there next to the Monbachschleifer. Right, okay. So the right. lads, uh, all of them are parked up down there, Perfect. right next to where you can see these. Oh, that's guys. lovely. You see Remo in his brand new build 1M here, so just the car chasing the R. Um, 33 Skyline. This is a brand new build for Remo. Remo is one of the funnest drivers I've ever met. I mean, I think he's, I'm, I don't want to age him here, so I'm going to say 40 something. He's not in his first, oh, he's a baby then, if he's funny. <laughs> but he's been driving for years and he still has that cheeky smile and the glint in his eye when he goes out and sends that car. Is that a six? Yeah, six series, yeah. Wow. Yeah, another big car. Yeah, another big car, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, uh, the G. The new G um, M3s, G comes after F. That's why you know it's the newest one. That's how I remember that. I remember yes. that. So we it was we have them both racing still. Yes. The F82 and the G82. Yes, um, the F80, I mean, I, I'm always an M3 over an M4 girl. Again, it's pick your poison. But, uh, yeah, F80, F80 M3 was the predecessor, which, funnily enough, you don't actually see that many, that of, many, them, of, them. That many of them in drifting. But the E92... Now, and the E46, E36, E30, not so much these days. The E36, 46, and E92 are extremely popular chassis. I mean, as you see, James has the E92, which is all carbon Kevlar. Oh, really? Yeah, that car is a, it's called the Eurofighter. It's HGK, they're a company in Latvia yeah. that create these beautiful masterpieces of So we're race talking cars. about bespoke building here. Oh, yeah. When this started, and it was on the streets of Japan, and, I, and I've been up around when we've been racing at Fuji. Yeah. And I, and, I, and they still do it on the roads around there. There's a few speed cameras on there, which kind of cur curtails it. But they were modified street cars. A lot of them were still metal. But what you're seeing now is that sport has evolved enough to be able to justify doing a bespoke build for a drift car. 
Yeah, absolutely. I so mean, what do you start with what? Do you start with the car, or do you start? Do you, could you have a tube frame chassis, or do you actually start with a monocoque and then start putting panels around it? So from memory, the rules. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from Driftmasters here, which is the European Championship. It has to be the original car from the A to C pillar. So everything from right. the front can be space framed, and everything beyond the C pillar can be space framed. Okay. But it has to start. It has to have the doors, everything that that air, um, core chassis there. But yeah, as I said, some of the builds that you're starting to see here um, are fairly crazy. There's a lot of a lot of money, time and money and investment gone into these vehicles. Okay, so why are people doing that? Does that mean there's fame, fortune and riches, or is it just for the recognition? We go motor racing yeah. and very few series, other than something like either MX5, where there's $1.2 million. Yeah. Um, you go and win Le Mans in a 24-hour race, and I think the top prize is about... 30,000 euros yeah. uh, and, and the manufacturer is, is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars so, so what's the reward here is it money uh, Are people make money out of it or is it just for the fun of it well you know what drifting when you're at, you're at the top of the game like I mean we have series in Europe we have drift masters and in the US we have formula drift which currently uh, we have one driver who's here who's competing in uh, formula drift yeah, I mean, if you get to the top of your game and you can become a professional driver, then, yeah, it's, you can do pretty well for yourself. So there are, there are professional drivers who are, who are earning a living yes. by drifting, by, by drifting. competing. Correct, right. yes, okay. absolutely. As ever, we've got a huge crowd down at the bottom of the Grand Prix circuit uh, at the Hairpin, and it's very busy here this weekend. Every single campsite uh, plot sold out as early as, uh, as Wednesday. If you're thinking of coming down, there are still tickets available for the big show tomorrow and Sunday, uh, but you'll probably have to find somewhere to stay. Just sleep in your car in the car park, if you will. All right, we're going to start uh, bringing it up a notch or two. The three Falcon cars, uh, drift cars, having a little bit of a demo. Now, this you wouldn't see in a drift competition, but this is precision driving as they're starting to throw these cars around in the circles that uh, we saw here last year and create an awful lot of Falcon tyre smoke. Yeah, it's always funny when you see them go into doing the donuts because uh, once you get about three rotations and you can't really see anything. <laughs> so I'm always like, oh my God, am I going to hit someone in a minute? But thankfully, James uh, has pulled out of that and uh, the guys are absolutely fine. But the, do you know what? What I love about this event each year is it's just so much fun. The energy and the vibe that that is down there on that corner is unmatched. I mean, it's just so busy and everyone's having fun. It's wicked. This is a very, very difficult thing to do if you've ever done any precision driving. And I've been fortunate enough to be in the car with people when they've done this. And it's nowhere near as scary as you think, actually, if you're with someone who's good, because you know that they are in control. Now, this is something quite new, and I really like it. This has come on in the last few years. This is uh, tyres, tyres specifically for drifting, that give you coloured tyre smoke. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what? I actually see them on Instagram because people do gender reveals with them. They just oh, do a, no they way! Do, they a do. blue or a pink tyre yeah, smoke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, you do see it quite a lot. Obviously, you won't see it in competition, but it's, it's a bit of fun for the evening. Lovely bit of falcon blue there. That's brilliant. Are you just having fun? I mean, look at them. They're just... <laughs> I just they're all over the track. <laughs> it's, it, it's much more difficult to do a donut than you think it is because <laughs> cars don't want to do that. Well, it, 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 that, that's where your left foot braking comes in because you, yes. you kind of want to just lock up just your inside it. front wheel yeah. just enough to be able to spin round it. And that's on... on car, even on specialist cars like this, you've got quite a lot of weight at the front because the engine's there. If you're yeah. doing it something like on a... Um, what was it that I was doing when we were doing the, the race championship in Barbados? Aerial Atom, oh, where yeah. you've, you've got the engine at the back and just the space frame at the front. Mm -hmm. You felt you could almost just lead out and, and hold on the front wheel. Yep. So just a little tap of the, the front brake and you could wind the... It was a race car as well, so you could wind the brake bias forwards. Actually really easy to do. These guys are having to, to, uh, to work quite hard and... and not only are you doing that, but you're looking at the other car. You have to pick a point on the car, whether it's the door mirror or the headlight or whatever, and keep your eye on that to keep your separation. 100%. Pick your point and pivot around it, my friend. Mm -hmm. A bit like ice skating, really. When you see people do 
uh, do the, the spins in ice skating, you get more points mm. for being in the same place. Do yeah. you? Oh, yeah. Were you an ice skater? Were you a, were you a figure I'm, skater I'm, once in your life? Not with my figure. <laughs> what, what, what are you, that? It cracked the ice, Becky. Come on. But <laughs> thank you for the... Thank you for the thought. Um, uh, sp sporting commentators have to do the strangest things. I uh, can sometimes. imagine. So uh, the, the knowledge of, a, of all different types of, of sport. If we go back to the competitive side, these yeah. guys are having fun now. They are. But if we go back to the competitive uh, side of things, so typically, um, how long would a drift meeting be? A couple of days, a day, three days? How does it work? A couple of days. So normally, I mean, if I just give you my schedule for, for what would be a normal uh, drift weekend, obviously you get there on a Thursday, set up. Friday is qualifying. Saturday is battles. Sunday is home time. All right. So at maximum on the ground for four days, I'd say. And venues? Are there particular venues that are linked inexorably to drifting? I mean, the, the great thing is if you've got space... You can do it pretty much anywhere. anywhere. So it could be a racetrack, it could be a large car park, it can be the bottom end of the race circuit here. But are there places in... Specifically. Yeah, where people go, oh, yeah, it's, for example, in... Um, in the sprint car world, the Knoxville Nationals, mm. Le Mans for the 24-hour race, mm. Nürburgring. Mm. Are there particular places that are well-known for big events and drifting around Europe and around the world? Yeah, I mean, I think drifting just piggybacks a corner of a, of a lovely racetrack, nice. if, I'm, if I'm totally honest with you. I mean, we have six stops um, in the European Championship calendar. So we start off in Ireland at Mondello Park, which is a very right. famous track. Yeah. Um, and we, we do the Global Warfare layout, which is just, just from the, the pit straight going down to that first big uh, right-hander. It's yeah. an incredible track that we have uh, there. Then in our second round, we head... We head to Sweden, which is the Drive AB Center, which is actually a very popular Porsche racing okay. track. So we, we use that there. Heading to Finland, the name escapes me of the track that we're going to in Finland. It's actually a brand new track for this year because right. the Finnish fans, oh my goodness, they are absolutely wild and they That's love drifting. And you, you know, at the moment, Kale Rovenpera, who is the last year's WRC champion, an amazing driver, young lad, he loves drifting, loves it. So he, he's uh, competing in four rounds of Is our he? champ. Yeah, he's literally really? he's double backing it with the WRC he's doing four rounds. He's joining us for Sweden and Finland, and um, yeah, incredible to think that somebody who is so talented in one discipline is he, he loves drifting like but you can understand particularly in the nordic countries car control is something that they are very good at and oh, that's why there's so many world rally I, 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 I knew Kala's father and when we were doing oh, all, all the rally yeah uh, great guy super 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 dry sense of, very, of, yes, of humor yes. really really good uh, and Kale, um youngest wrc champion he's really uh, had uh, a good few years since he burst onto the scene. I can understand that the skill set is is similar uh, and good for him. Yeah, uh, for jumping into it. He is a good driver. I mean, not that you would expect it. Do you know what I mean? Like he, he's an incredible rally driver, and he's actually a, an incredible drift driver as well. He has an A90 Supra. He's actually competing in. Uh, yeah, he's he's actually doing quite a lot now. I think about it. Like he's doing the full WRC season. Mm -hmm. He's also coming to join us at Driftmasters, and then he's also going to Japan to compete in Formula Drift Japan out there Is as he? well. That's how much he loves it. Oh wow! So you know we're incredibly honoured to have uh, a driver of that caliber joining our field. But it it does just show having precision car control is is really really key, and that's why I think. Drifting is having such a moment. It's because people are really recognising that this isn't just street O, this isn't just lads on roundabouts. You know, we've, we've come so far away oh, yeah. from that stereotype. But well, this is true, pure precision driving. Well, you know, let's remember 100 years ago um, when we started motor racing, just over that, it was all point-to-point -point racing on mm -hmm. what were then public roads. Uh, eventually, for most, of, for most of motor racing, it was thought reasonably so on the grounds of safety uh, that the racing should be taken off the roads and that's one of the reasons this circuit and the Nordschleifer and the now yeah. sadly lost Sudschleifer um, that was to, um, to, to take it off the roads mm. in the old Eiffel Rennen, the Eiffel races uh, to take it off the roads and, and bring it into some kind of control. Yeah. The way that this sport has uh, evolved is not too different from that because it started on the streets 
And now, if you're in the US, by the way, and I know we're talking to everybody around the world at the moment, Road Atlanta, um, down yeah. in the big bowl at Road Atlanta, 10-8, the uh, they, they do a lot of drifting down I there. was there last weekend. Oh, were you really? I was. I was in, uh, at Road Atlanta, which is a beautiful facility, isn't yeah. it? Oh, my goodness. The elevation changes on that track the first crazy. track I went to in the States. Really? Yeah. It's a beautiful facility. Yeah, I was there. Um, James competes in Formula Drift currently with uh, the Ford RTR Mustang uh, team. So he's out there. Um, having a lot of fun at the minute he's got a brand new first only right hand drive 2024 s650 uh s650 ford mustang yeah so it is a brand new build and yeah he's uh, competing in Ford formula drift and we were there at road atlanta last weekend uh which Splash was an, an exciting ex well. oh unreal yeah I love to georgia uh, yeah. about 90 minutes or depend on traffic actually because the, the traffic is uh something to behold the Just end for does Vaughan Gittin still uh, he does. over there? Do you know Ford? Vaughan Gittin Jr., he cracks me up because there's a man who has some energy. Like, he was there last weekend. He's actually uh, stepped away because he has a three-car team. So he has Adam LZ jumping in. He has James Dean, and he also has Chelsea Denofa driving as well. But Adam LZ has taken a step back, and he's only doing four events. So Vaughan was like, do you know what? I'm going to jump back I'm in the car. Back for it. You wow. know what he did? He did his first event last week in Atlanta. Do you know where he came? He won it. He won it. Of course he did. He was at a ball of energy. He went out there and he was like, this is mine. And nobody, he was like a freight train. Nobody was getting in the way of that I man. actually first met him at Road Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, when we were there for Petite Le Mans. That was his first um, event win, I think. 20 years. 20 years ago. Because he was celebrating last weekend that he, he just couldn't believe, you know, 20 years later he steps on the podium again. Uh, the first track he ever pulled a handbrake at. Just doesn't it prove, though, that the skills don't go away? Absolutely not. No, absolutely, absolutely not. It, and, and also... Drifting is such a fun sport. You know, Vaughan's brand is the is the fun haver, fun haver brand, and that is exactly what he goes out there and does. I I sense Becky from what we spoke about last year, and and you know from what we've seen already today, and talk to you again. It's it's a very friendly paddock. Yes, there's competitive side of things, but it's a bit weird. It's a bit wacky. I mean, anybody who does this who thinks, right, OK, I'm going to go and start drifting. You know, you've got to have a particular mindset. And it seems, you've said the word fun a lot, but it also seems, you know, quite a, a friendly atmosphere here. 100%. I mean, this, so uh, the accessibility in the paddock is really good. You know, you can get round and chat to all the teams. I can, you know what I've always said, like, I, I host the championship, and what I see more than ever, they always want to fight not a forfeit you know some people would be happy if their competitor didn't pull to the line no no these guys will be sending their mechanics over if they have the spare parts that they need to fix that car they will send them over because they want to have and they want to have a fight on the track yeah. but, it, but it is that friendly atmosphere they will everybody helps each other there is none of that like oh he's broken okay we have the part we're not going to give it to him they, they will make sure that their competitors are out on the track and I've always really loved that so about the sport keeping it safe Mm -hmm. and keeping it off the streets, mm -hmm. clearly. Yep. Um, how does one get started? Where where do you go to find out if you, you're any good at this without having to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of, of pounds, dollars, euros, yen, or whatever <laughs> in, in building yourself a, a bespoke car? So you, there are a lot of drift schools. Oh, he's had a little bit of an off there. Whoopsie. Um, there are lots of drift schools in each country where you can go for a day, get yourself accustomed with a car, probably like a learner car, would be like a 350Z or an IS200, something like that, something fairly simple to drive. And you can have a day's tuition and just sort of see how you feel about it. I mean, thankfully, one of the good things that why I think drifting has exploded uh, the way it has is that it's quite... It's relatively low barriers to entry with the price, you know, for a car. So if you went out there and got yourself an E36 BMW, got yourself a little extra lock kit, put a hydro handbrake in. Don't get me wrong, all cars are expensive, oh, but it's it's not it's not quite the expense of getting yourself a uh, you know like a full-on race car. A Porsche race yeah, car. Yeah, Porsche race car exactly. Yeah, well, you, you pay the Porsche. Trust me, as a Porsche owner, you know. I know oh, what that, Porsche have you got? Um, how long have you got? Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Uh, 992 GTS manual. Uh, nice. Oh, I think you were just getting that last year, weren't you? 
that, that I remember. This is my first trip here, didn't I? I bar. remember. But that's a I year remember. old. Um, we, uh, we've got a, a 968 uh, club sport, or sport rather, uh, 993, which is the last of the air cools. Here we go. That's a lovely List, car. Listing them off. Two listing them off. Uh, and uh, a 981 Boxster Love as well. It. I, I only have one. I've got my 930, 911 Turbo. And oh, I, yes, I you told me that last year. That's that a class. Car. Well, you can't get rid of that. Though, can never. You? Oh, never, never, never. Particularly never. If not if you've had it for a while and you know a bit of history. Yeah, That's the problem. That. You, once you do that, how do you pick between them? Yeah. Between them all. So it, is, is that what everybody has to do? The build their own cars? Or is there a market for pre-built second-hand cars when people change and move on? Or do they tend to, you know, a bit like me, all right, I I've got this car, right, I'm going to build myself a new one. Oh, I don't want to get rid of that one, though, because that, that, that has, a, I have a, it's pulling me hard to it. Yeah, sentimental way. Yeah, I mean, there are, you can go to a, you can go to somebody and say, I want a, a drift car, and, and they'll build it for you, you know, but a lot of people get quite hands-on with it, because, as I say, to get a car to slide, you need to lock that rear diff, so you probably put a two-way in it, or you could even put a welded diff in if you're starting really at the bottom. And then you just put your hydro handbrake in, you've got a lock diff, and you can pretty much go drifting from there. I mean, obviously, in the beginning, you won't have a lot of lock, but these three simple modifications, and you can get yourself sliding. And, and are, are competitions graded uh, in terms of, of, like, classes, or is it, is it everybody together? Because in motor racing, obviously, you wouldn't yeah. put... Look, here, we've got a, uh, we've got a Dacia running <laughs> in, 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 its, in a class for smaller engine cars. They are, are up against the Ferraris and the... Mercedes Benzes and the Porsches that the, the GT3 cars at the front of the field. Yeah. Is there a class structure within drift as well? Nope, there there isn't. I mean, <laughs> every man or woman for themselves. Every man or woman for themselves. I mean, in the states you have pro spec and pro, but that's more ability level right. than than, yeah. than uh, you the know cars. And, than yeah. cars. Yeah. You, you know, a 500 horsepower car can line up against a thousand horsepower car. So and is there any reason why the 500 horsepower car couldn't win? No, because it's it's the driver that's going to be the difference. Well, it's it's how precise he is on track. You know, it's actually quite an interesting matchup when you have a high horsepower car versus a low horsepower car. I mean, obviously the higher one is going to be faster, um, and it's quite difficult to chase a slower car because you know when you've got that when that the engine is is chomping at the bit that much, and you're having and you're trying to chase that car, and you have to slow it down so much, it's hard to keep angle, etc. So we've got Remo and James going here. James is going to chase Remo as chase as he can, as close as he can, because these guys have been friends for years, and he'll want to put on a, a nice. show here. So he's just coming up the inside of him. Oh, look at that! Lovely. Now you can just see the brake light on James' car just flashing on and off as he was just going on and off. The, the brake with his left foot. Left foot braking, uh, if you've never done it before, don't try it uh, <laughs> without uh, getting some practice in, in a very, very wide open place. Caveat, <laughs> yes, right there. Please don't try this at home. Don't try. But it, it is a, 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 a race and rally um, technique that uh, allows you to balance the car. Now, a lot of cars now with paddle shift, of course, only have two pedals, mm. but you could do it on a three pedal car as well. Front wheel drive cars, which Ooh, you, you'll goodness. never see in drifting, because you know that's not going to work. Um, that was a bit uh, yeah, it was tight. A sketch, wasn't it? Two monster <laughs> that energy is, cars. That is Luke Woodham and uh, Steve Biagioni, as I said, PS13 and S14, both running LS engines. But I was like, just checking to see if his bonnet clips were holding that down, because it is, it is wibbly wobbling, but I'm, I'm sure it's absolutely fine. Who's in this BMW with the multiple lights set up on the front? Yeah, that I like tried an, to. I tried an to Alpha find, SZ. Yeah, I tried to find his number earlier. Um, that's him, that's him, too, on the side. I can't see through this tires. No, we're both going to have to put our glasses on in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting looking vehicle. I really like that uh, quad headlamp setup. Yeah, that's the, the fun thing about when it gets into the night events is you'll see quite a lot of the cars will have like fun underglow and I don't know, it just all adds adds to the show. Uh, and uh, fluorescent strips, LED strips, has yeah. transformed us being able to spot race cars in the dark. I can only imagine how creative you can get in uh, in the, the drift world. There's there's no there's no end to what you could do. So when's the next round of the European Championship, uh, Becky, and where is it? So that is on the 9th and 10th of June, and it is at the Drive Centre AB in Sweden. It's in Lulea, which is like pretty much the last stop before you get into Antarctica. It's in the very north of Sweden. Um, yeah, which will be great, because you know what? It's a brilliant facility. It's almost brand new. Like, if you're into your 911, I'm pretty sure uh, the, the Cup cars uh, run there, you know, the Carrera Cup. 
they are they're at uh, right. the drive centre AB. Uh, Jason Childrick is uh, tweeted in at RSL underscore studio using our hashtag for the weekend uh, RSL N24. He says, can you remember if can you ask Becky if she remembers when the British Drift Championship and the King of Europe went to Lyndon Hill in Kent racetrack and rally cross track? He said, I'm marshal there every year and it used to be fantastic. Do we still have a drift scene in the UK? Yeah, we do. We, I mean, it's changed quite a lot over the years. I mean, at the time that he's talking about there, he's talking about the BDC days and the King of Europe, which was, I will admit, a little bit before my time. But I have seen lots of content from when there was drifting at Lydon Hill because I think it was... I think they didn't allow drifting at Lydon Hill anymore. Oh, really? I think it was noise regulated. You know, every, tra uh, yeah. every track suffers it's with noise. It's the bane of our life Absolutely. in motor racing in the UK. It, well, that's exactly it. So, you know, as you were just saying, are there, uh, drifting has a little bit of a hard time in the UK simply because of these noise regulations, mm. you know? So um, I'm, I'm happy that you had many, many good memories marshalling there at Lydon Hill. I've seen some amazing content from uh, over the years. So the European Championship doesn't go to the UK anymore, so no. you'd have to come across in the... Yeah. To Europe. Any, uh, anywhere, France, Belgium, the low country? So we go Ireland, Sweden, Finland. Then we go to Riga and Latvia, which is an amazing right. round. Love that, love that. The Bikaniki Trasa, which is one of the fastest and most dangerous tracks that we have our, 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 in our championship. I mean, huge entry speed. Talking only 100 miles an hour. What? Yeah. It's crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's fantastic. You know, it's a spectacle. One of my favourite tracks of, of the year. Then we go from uh, Riga, Latvia to Feropolis, which is an abandoned... Not abandoned. It's, it's, it used to be an old mine. And I, the only way I can explain this to you is it's an open-air mining museum. So you know those massive machinery? Oh, yeah. This yeah. provides all the backdrop to this track right. in the middle of it. And it's, it's a night event. It's great. It looks... But on tarmac. Not on tarmac, yes. Yeah, on tarmac, yes. Yeah. Um, it's on a lake. I mean, it's just, yeah, it sounds... It sounds and where's that in the world? Feropolis. So right. that is uh, near Leipzig, oh, in Germany. OK. okay. Um, and then we go from there to Poland. Now, all roads lead to the final round in Poland. We have got the biggest stadium that we have ever tried to fill. Okay. It's, I think it's... I'm going to... Don't quote me on this, but I think it's 50,000 seats. Wow. Yeah, so what they're and doing... And is that as a permanent stadium, it's a, as a permanent sports stadium or something? Yeah, it's, it's actually a football stadium. Um, right. And they're creating their very own custom drift track in the middle of it. It's in the centre of Warsaw. It's, oh, wow. It, this is what I mean. Stadium when, drifting. When I tell you that drifting is having a moment, the events are getting crazier, the events are getting bigger. Out the gravel, oh, lads. Oh, out the gravel, come, come on. on. So uh, stadium drifting. So, you know, this, this is... Taking the concept of uh, of, of um, risk champions, where we brought that indoor, started off in, in Tenerife for rallying, and then we brought it into uh, sports stadia around the world and uh, laid down a, a temporary surface. And I've, I've, is there, how are you going to get enough room? to lay that down. Honestly, it uh, it was wild last year because... Oh, you've done it before? So we had a smaller stadium that we did it in, and they literally... It's a football stadium, right. and they literally, in a week, laid all the tarmac, right. and then the second the event finished... To pull it up again. Pull it up. Wow. Yeah, and this, this is called the PGE Stadium in the centre of Warsaw, and it's a huge... It's a huge venue, and we're going to... Oh, yeah, with a running track around the yeah, outside and everything. So you're going to have all... The, hang on a minute. It's got a roof. Yeah. How are you going to get rid of all the tyres, Mum? Don't ask me questions I can't answer. <laughs> Don't ask me the questions. Open simply... the doors at the back, please. I am simply the host. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> but, wow, what, what an event that is going to be. I mean, if, you're, if you want to see a spectacle, I'm telling you guys, that is going to be oh, huge. And that's in September, the 15th and 16th of September. Now, that the big six series, BMW 2 and full 360s there. That takes a bit of doing. You've got to reverse the lock in the middle of it to get the front wheels to spin round. Uh, elements of uh, not just precision driving, but defensive driving uh, yeah. as well there. A couple more BMWs. Here's my favourite, the Drift Taxi. You just love that thing, don't I, you? I looked every at last time, year and I'm so pleased it's back. But look how tiny and titchy that looks now. That, that, was, that was a big car when they came out. Yeah. Beautiful thing. I do. I think that's peak BMW, four-door BMW. Yeah, yeah. I just love the proportions of it. Oh, by the way, 
nobody said about that car. Oh, do you know what the matter with that car is? It needs a honking, great, much big, bigger grill on the front of it. Nobody said that in those days. Are we, are we going to get into to grill politics here about PMWs? I mean, I have, I have an E21, so the first of the three series. And honestly, when I sit that next to my G80, I'm like, lads, how have we got here? I know. <laughs> I know, I know, but you know what? The guys from BMW uh, for, and from BMW Racing, uh, when Mike Crack, who's, who was uh, head of uh, M Series and, and Performance before he went to Aston Martin, he said to me, hey, there's only one thing worse than being um, talked about, and that's not being talked about. Well, so, he's, you know, he, he was quite happy to talk about it. Let me tell you, BMW M are doing huge, huge things. They, BMW M's sales are actually more than AMG and Audi Sport combined. Wow. Just to put that out there. Because you know what? Look at what they're putting out. We've got new M cars. We've got new CS cars. We've got a new M2 with crazy... But, you know, they're, they're pushing the boundary in, in a world where manufacturers are starting to electrify everything and, and things are starting to become, you know, I'm going to say dampen down a little bit, but BMW are, are out there and they're putting big wings on things. They're putting wider fenders on things, carbon the whole she shebang and I, you know I rate them for it oh whoopsie and, and they sell a lot of them uh, and it, it, it is a fact that even going they back do. to um, big sales in the UK there was uh, more BMW 3 Series sold than there were um, Ford Mondeos and Ford Sierras uh, they are a very very popular car you mentioned the E word there electric anybody doing electric drift huge amounts of talk on those but I presume Oops. the batteries the heavy batteries are a little bit tricky to get a car balance with yeah so i mean there have been electric drift cars and uh most notably vaughan gitten as we were talking about they made a mac e you know their, their oh, yeah. suv which was yeah. an all electric crazy thing i think i mean the thousands of horsepower yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly it, it was, as much as you want to turn the motor up to well basically. i think it had a motor on each wheel so it had independent Oh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. And the thing was absolutely flying all over the place. I mean, you know what? The power's there. It was just a big vehicle to control and a lot of weight, you know. And, and of course, before his untimely um, death, uh, we also had Ken Block with uh, electric yes. cars. Yeah, he had, that he, had the, he had the out, quattro. Out, yeah, did that phenomenal uh, run out in Vegas. Um, yeah, unreal. Where well, they brought out all of the, the Le Mans cars. What a legend. Well. What an absolute yeah, lost legend. Too it. soon, unfortunately. It, yeah, it's a huge, uh, shock, huge shock to the community. But my goodness, that man, that man left a, a legacy that is, I, I think, is unmatched. I mean, he, he, his, what he did lives on in all of us, you know. Did, did, did that, that was a crossover moment uh, for, for, the, for the sport. He, he got right into the public consciousness that he was already well known in, in, yeah. in rallying. Mm. Was that important, do you think, to get to a bigger audience? That somebody like that was was doing the kind of things with his Jim Carner that Ken Block was doing? I mean, you can absolutely... You, you can never take away how important Jim Carner was to getting out to the wider world. You know, he was uh, obviously four-wheel drive drifting. And it just... Oh, my goodness. It just opened up the doors to, to, to people that probably would never have... have been into sliding cars and stuff, but he made it cool. He was a master of marketing, absolute master of marketing. Everything he did was just spot on. Yeah. And he really managed to, to take it to the masses. I mean, he was an extremely clever guy. And uh, a perfectionist as well. Yeah, 100%. Just cool, cool guy. Yeah. Really cool guy. It's lost too soon. Where, where, are, where can we, for those people who are watching this, maybe seeing this as a little taster, dip in the water, where can they follow the championships around the world? And I presume... Uh, it's it's uh, far easier now to televise things and to stream them. Mm. You don't have to rely on linear platforms, TV, national networks. You can do things yourselves. We've done that, that in motorsport yep. for a while. RC racing, karting, all of that. Mm -hmm. Now doing their own things. How can people watch and follow along? So if you're looking to tune in to our uh, Red Bull... If you're looking to tune into the Driftmasters European Championship, we are working with Red Bull, so we're going to be live on Red Bull TV throughout throughout the series. Um, also, if you're looking to tune into uh, Formula Drift in the States, they have their own channels on YouTube, so they stream the whole thing. Um, I mean, I'm always going to say that Drift Masters is the best championship in the world. Uh, you know, you gotta you got to back yourself some, at some point. But, uh, yeah, the show... I've is heard the presenter's quite good. Uh, well, you know, you know. She pops in every now and then. <laughs> Once a year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's a fantastic show, and it, it's made by the people, the drivers. You know, it, it's just incredible competition. 
loads of fun, great tracks. And the commentators, Dave, uh, Dave Egan and Ian Waddington that I work with, they are, they're just funny guys. They're yeah. great. They really get into it. And it's pretty quick fire as well, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, I, I think we were talking about this the other day. Everybody keeps telling us that people don't have long attention spans anymore. I, I think that's nonsense, to be honest, because endurance racing, even up to the 24-hour races, our audience is getting younger. We're getting more females, and I'll talk to you about that uh, in a moment. And people say the youth of today, uh, they don't watch linear television, uh, and they've got short attention span. Okay, they don't watch linear television, but people binge watch television for eight hours at a time and yeah. watch a full set. Yeah, it's streaming. It, it's this is non-stop action. It's a bit like Speedway. It's a bit like Rallycross. It's condensed. It's boiled down, and it's all action all the time, isn't it? It is absolutely. And you know what? You get that feeling of you know red car or blue car. Who's going to win? And and you get and you get that, <laughs> like that you get that fix of you know you can make your make your bet. Who's going to win? And it's it is really exciting. You know you don't know what's going to happen happen next and there's, a, there's an element of danger to it everybody likes to see cars coming in hot hot on the chat there like yeah. right next to each other it's an incredible show i mean i, I am a huge fan of drifting i think that it uh, uh gives you everything you need now you you do compete there are other females who compete yes are we are we breaking down the barriers are we getting to young female drivers and getting them interested in this part of motorsport 100%. You know, I'm seeing a huge influx of girls uh, coming into into drifting. I mean, we have a few. We have a UK driver. We have Tessa Whittock, uh, Ames Hill, Jojo McDonald. You know, we have a good few drivers across the world. In the States, we have Kelsey Rowling. You know, these names are, are There's really... no reason why they can't. There's absolutely, absolutely, no, absolutely no reason. reason there's no reason why physical you can't. reason. There's no, no mental reason no. why they can't be. As no. I obviously always say about motor racing, we, we got Catherine Lake out of uh, our series in the States mm. uh, trying to qualify for Indianapolis uh, at the moment uh, and uh, get into the big show at the weekend. The car, the stopwatch of the track, uh, doesn't know and doesn't care who the driver is yeah. uh, and, and what gender uh, the, the driver is. And that's exactly the same throughout motorsport, is that there's no reason why there shouldn't be more female drivers. 100%. You know what? And this is the great thing. As it gets more and more popular and these school days become more and more popular, I'm seeing a lot of content online, on Instagram, uh, YouTube. There are lots of girls getting into it. And personally, I love to see it. I love to see it. Mixed competition, of course, as we have in uh, uh, mostly in circuit racing. So mm -hmm. no all-female series. Get out there. And it's driver That's versus fun. driver, car versus car. 100%. And you know what? Like... Drifting is a very friendly, uh, very friendly sport. So if you are looking to learn, you know, reach out to somebody that you've that you've seen and, and just ask them, like, you know, where did you go? Where did you start? And, and you know what? It's yeah, the information is out there. I would always say, go and find it. What's the hardest thing to do when you're learning? What's the thing that you've got to either learn or you've got to get over the fear of? What is what is it? What for you, what was the corner that you turned when all of a sudden it was like pulling the curtains open and going, ah, now I get it. Commitment, commit to your corner. If you're, oh, flat, right. if you're coming in at 60 miles an hour, it, it, if you don't commit, you, you, you know, you're going to understeer because yeah. you, need to, you need to initiate that car and you need to get it into a slide. But if, if, you, if you're like, oh, and, and, and you hesitate, then the car will then understeer because, you know, you're, you're looking to really throw the weight of that car and then use that, that, that physical momentum to get back on the power and get the car moving. So it is a bit of like, you've got to commit. That was the biggest thing for me because, you know, the bigger corners, you're coming in quite hot. And uh, sometimes you have to click that, click that button in your brain, which goes, that's fine. I'm, I'm going into a right-hander at 60. If I just pull the handbrake now, everything's going to be fine. See, that's like driving, that's like getting out of a quote-unquote normal race car and getting into a downforce racing car. Yeah. You can't we, see downforce, you can't smell no. it, you can't touch it, but it's your friend <laughs> if you believe in it. Look at this, yeah, I'm to push him off the track and everybody's cheering him, well, I love that, it. That's one of our um, fire units here, so that's, that's not uh, required. Yeah, what, once, you, once you believe in it, you know that it's there, that it makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. So I, I completely understand uh, what you're talking about there. So who is that number fifty? Five zero. It is Christoph Hamacher. He's in the, he competes in the Nurburg Drift Cup. Uh, it looks like his uh, S14 has uh, given up the ghost for the day. Nice uh, purple and white uh, colour scheme. Yeah. I think it's uh, it's rather um, 
a bit ironic if you're a race car driver and the, <laughs> and the truck pulls up with the flames on and that is actually one of the fire tenders. I like it. It's yeah. great. Do you know, I, I saw, I bless him, I saw this guy on the track yesterday when I think uh, we were the doing one the qualified. car. The, 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 Volkswagen. the Volkswagen Golf. And it started as a small fire. Yeah. And then he went running to try and get the... the and, and by the time he came back, I was like, lads, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a big done. fire. That car's done. They're, they're trying to, they're, they're, they were trying to ship in a replacement car, the team. Oh, really? Uh, I'm a, sorry to hear that. A couple of teams. I mean, there's nothing you can do at that point. It was... To, we just, he I, did, he saw, thank goodness he didn't open the, the, the bonnet. Well, yeah, but, you but, know, absolutely. That's always the one thing. And do you know what? It seems so elementary, doesn't it? Just to be like, oh, okay, open the bonnet to, to get the no, fire. No, no. You, just, you feed it a big Ob load of oxygen. oxygen and correct. And then it's uh, gone zone. What's... I mean... That's actually, a, it's a good point that you're making there about yeah. that. And what sort of safety stands? So do the cars have to get scrutinized yes. before they go? And obviously they have a cage. Do they have fire suppression and, and everybody yeah. wears uh, fireproofs? Absolutely. Like you know, uh, safety is paramount. Well, when you've got cars running race fuel and, and nearly 1,000 horsepower, some of these cars are running. So, you know, the, there is obviously always... Uh, you know, there's always the possibility. It's dangerous. Absolutely. So it on your ticket. It does. It does indeed. So they they wear full fire, uh, full fire suits and and helmets and, and under undergarments and things like that. But they also have a fire system in the car, and each car has to be tagged and scrutinised before it's allowed to head out on track. I mean, there is actually the FIA Intercontinental Drifting. Uh, really? Cup. Yeah, the FIA are involved now. So there is a once a year event that they run. Um, which is quite prestigious. I'm sure. It's great. I mean, you know, the FIA that are getting involved in, in drifting, again, this is another step forward for the sport. That is, in some ways, that is, that's the, the step mm -hmm. that brings it into being considered by, look, you know, I know, and I suspect a lot of the people who are watching and listening this know um, how much skill and commitment is going into this both time effort and indeed financial but for the greater public general public um getting fia approval says oh you actually are real motorsport now and, and, I, and I don't say that in a nasty way yeah but that for the for the general public, that that will make a difference, won't it? Well, I think I think for for people who wouldn't be particularly into the motorsport, if they see FIA is over it, that I think it adds a little bit of legitimacy into people's eyes that maybe wouldn't be so clued up on on their motorsports, let's say. Which I I think is brilliant. I mean, uh, James Dean, who sat there in the E92 on the line there. I mean, this guy has been driving for the last 16 years. And he's just watched the sport evolve and grow. And he is an FIA champion. He, he won the Intercon Intercontinental Drifting. I think it was 2021 that he won it. And does that move around? Or is it all yes. Separate? No, it's in different places. Oh, right. So it, the last time I went to it was in Latvia at the Bikaniki Tressa. Right. So these two guys, I mean, uh, also bag they've been watching the sport evolve for years. So. Oh, big, big use of the e-brake there. Hydraulic handbrake from the Monster. Energy car. And James is pushing him. He really is. <laughs> Lovely exit from the hairpin. And then just an extra little left-right flick. Yeah, lovely. I mean, it's... Oh, okay. they're, pu they're pushing on right round the next S's as well. Yeah. So they're going for a bit further right onto the dirt from the two. I think this Falcon might be cars. this might be the last runs of the evening. So yeah, they, they, they seem to be putting a lot into it. Uh, Becky, thank you very much for being with us. It's been a, an absolute pleasure. Again, have a cracking year. Yeah, I'm hopefully, excited. we have uh, got a few more people interested. You're always welcome in uh, our global broadcast centre. Thank you. I've Be absolutely loved it. You know, I, I love talking about drifting. I always spread the message. It's fun, it's fast, as I said earlier. It's smelly, it's loud, it's all the good things, all, uh, all the righteous stuff when it comes to motorsport. Um, Ever, ever thought of doing uh, an inside drift series that uh, you know goes behind the scenes, gets some of the gets some of the sweary personalities? You could call it slide to survive. How about that? I'll give you that. Wow! One. I'll give you that one. There you wow. go. Wow! I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> I'll be on, I'm gonna. Get, I'll, I'll be on the phone to my agent straight after this. I'll be like, right. I'll, I'll let's take bookmark a, that. a small commission. Yes, yeah, a small, small commission. You guys have all heard it here first live, so I can't even get away with saying it's fine. Please, those conversations. <laughs>
Uh, yes, I, I thank you so much for having me. And I really, really hope that we are back again next year. All, we, all I always think with this is whatever anybody else thinks, there's been people tuned in from all over the world, as always, on this. And by the way, thanks to our TV team from Nürburgring TV for staying on and doing this as well and getting the drone cameras up, etc. Yeah. Uh, down at the bottom end of the track. Just look at how many people are sitting there. The temperature's dropped considerably. Yes. It's an hour later than we thought it was going to be. And it, it's a lot chillier out there than it was in the sunshine this afternoon. But that's a big crowd that stayed on. If you haven't experienced this for yourself, find out where you can go and see it locally, whichever country you are in the world, and tune in. Find out where it is on the web. Thanks very much, Becky. Say hi to James for us as well. Will do. I know there's a lot of work gone into this as well. This isn't a competition, so this is just a This is a, a nice display. bit of bit of fun for yeah. the lads. Uh, bit of fun for the weekend. It's an incredible event to be a part of. Again, you know, the fact that we're invited back here to the N24, which is one of the best motorsport events, I think, globally. Yeah. And we're here. We're having some fun. We're laying down some 11s. <laughs> it's a big 11. <laughs> They're so sideways at some points, they're actually just ones. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's what I, A one with a little bit of a shadow behind yeah, it. Nice. That's, I'm very impressed with the, the two new uh, G8Ts. Very impressed with the G8Ts. Yeah. It looks like we're getting, oh, uh, we're getting everybody laying it down. They, you know what, they know, they're like, right lads, we've got two minutes left, just send everybody, have some yeah. fun. Three car, four car trains, just like old times. Yeah, the, the lights just lining up on the far end of the circuit. I wish, but I, I, I want to see a Porsche 928 V8 drift car. That's all right. There was, there was a. Uh, the V8 it's quite good. Yeah, I mean, I, if you I have a look online, I'd what's the oddest drift car? We'll finish off with this. What's the oddest car that you've seen made into a drift car? We see so many BMWs, so many of the Japanese manufacturers. Is there one thing that you've just said? Wow, that's really cool. And you've never seen another, either a manufacturer or a particular model that you've never seen anything like it. I mean, uh, we, I guess we have to kind of talk about the V8 Vantage pure all carbon oh, drift yes. car that, you know, Darren Kelly runs yes. in the States. So that's, a, that's an impress. And the, the noise off that thing, like, it revs to the high heavens. But it, it's incredible. You know, like, okay, that's a, that's a brand new Aston Martin chassis that's been made into a drift car. You gotta love it. I want to see somebody slam an SUV as well and make a drift car out of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm trying to think, strangest, strangest drift car that I've ever seen. I mean, any, does anybody do it? Uh, there the tend to be two or four doors. Does anybody do estate cars or wagons? Oh, pick, goodness. Or yes. pickup trucks and things yeah, like that. Yeah, absolutely. All different body styles. Yeah, all different. I mean, we have Mika Kesky Corpi, who's one of our drivers and drift masters. He, he, he runs a, a wagon. Wagons are actually quite popular. I see quite a lot of them, bizarrely, in Scandinavia. I do like I, I like a fast wagon. I yeah, really do. I'm a bit of a. I'm a, a bit of a soft spot for a fast wagon. Yeah. Over the years. I mean, they are they are cool, aren't they? Let's, and and let's of course, you can get you can get um, G80, well, the, the new touring, the M3 touring. Yeah, M3 Great touring. Car. Finally, finally, we get an official touring, so Alpina don't have to build one for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and Three pink. Ah, very nice. It's a girl. Uh, that's what we were it's talking about. Uh, yeah, I was the, like, the so I was it's like, like, is it? a little BMW's compact. Isn't yeah, it's it? a little it 36 compact, yeah. Little stubby. Yeah. Excellent. They're great cars to learn in, you know. I Are was uh, competing in an E36 compact uh, a few months ago, and I, I had great crack in it. It was wicked. Oh, uh, yeah, it looks like we're wrapping up here. Uh, Becky, we'll let you get back. I know, I've, I've, I've got, this. I know you've got things to do. I've got to run away and go back to hosting. Uh, and you go and do that now. Uh, thank you for joining. This looks like the big... This is like all of the rest of the fireworks have been let off in the same place. The big send-off. The big send-off. Thanks to Becky and the rest of the Falcon Drift team. We'll let the guys uh, play us out in their own inimitable manner and we'll be back tomorrow for the big show. Join us here at the Nürburgring uh, for the uh, 51st ADAC Total Energy Nürburgring 24. From Becky and John, have a good Friday. Good night, guys. Bye. Oh, six together. This could be trouble. Thanks, <laughs> Becky. Bye. Bye. Bye.